general rule we like to think of is like wait at least an hour after you wake up or two before eating anything with calories you want to be taking in food when your body is active and moving and can process that food and not at the end of the day when you're going to be sitting down and probably be sedentary try to be in bed for eight hours so that you can get seven hours of sleep and people who do eight to ten hours time restricted eating uh, the first thing they mention is they sleep much better Welcome back. In today's episode, we dive headfirst into a masterclass dedicated to all things fasting. Courteous of my brilliant guests and esteemed scientists, Drs. Emily Manoogian, Courtney Peterson, Volta Longo, and Sachin Panda. If you front load calories early in the day, you actually reduce mean 24 hour blood sugar levels. You actually make blood sugar levels lower just by timing more of that caloric intake to the kind of sweet spot during the day when your blood sugar metabolism is at its highest. Say you have a milkshake in the middle of the night, now your body can't process that glucose. You might get a really high spike in blood glucose and those kinds of things that are happening perpetually over and over again can lead to things like prediabetes or diabetes. Please enjoy. This is The Proof on Fasting. Time-restricted eating, uh, often uh, also time-restricted feeding is used depending on the type of study. We hear intermittent fasting, we hear about fasting. Can we kind of define some of these terms so that as we're progressing through the conversation, things are making a little bit more sense? Yeah, I'll I'll take a stab at it, Uh, Courtney, if you have any corrections, please, Um, because there's some debate in that. Um, Intermittent fasting is a general term for saying you're having periods where you're having either zero calories except for water or limited calories within a day. And the two most common forms of that are alternate day fasting and 5-2 fasting. Some people also consider time-restricted eating a form of intermittent fasting, and that can be also called a 16-8 diet. Um, But time-restricted eating in general is where you consume all calories, really anything that isn't water, to a 6 to 12, usually 6 to 10 hour eating interval. And the rest of that time, you are only consuming water and it's a consistent daily eating window. This doesn't move around. Um, Time-restricted feeding was originally termed in the uh, basic uh, clinical, not clinical, but the basic trials done in animals. Um, And when it switched to clinical trials, humans really don't like being told that they feed. So the term got switched to eating. So uh, some people still use TRF when referring to clinical trials. uh, But at least in our work, we, we switched all of our clinical work to refer to as TRE. Yeah, and there's a little bit of, of debate on what's the minimum duration of hours and number of hours you need to be practicing fasting for something to constitute intermittent fasting. And I would say most people these days say, say it's at least uh, 12 to 14 hours mm-hmm. of fasting. And then something else that comes up in the literature and no doubt will come up in this conversation is this idea of early time-restricted eating versus later time-restricted eating. Can Courtney, perhaps you could help us understand the differences between those? Sure, absolutely. So when you're practicing time-restricted eating, you're eating in a shorter time period each day. And you can do that by either eating breakfast later in the day and or dinner earlier in the day. Um, And what's really interesting is there's been research out of Israel showing that eating breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and dinner like a pauper actually improves weight loss, blood sugar control, lowers your appetite, and also actually even improves fertility. So really impressive results. So there's been this sort of discussion or debate in the scientific community. Can you get the same benefits of time-restricted eating regardless of the time of day of your eating window? Um, And so we're starting to see research on that topic, but we don't know the answer yet. So one of the big things that's been tested is, you know, um, time-restricted eating by skipping breakfast. So the study you mentioned with Ethan Weiss, they actually compared practicing time-restricted eating by skipping breakfast with three meals a day. So the time-restricted eating group actually ate a little bit later in the day. Now, they didn't see positive results in that study, but there are also other studies that find benefits, even if you practice time-restricted eating by eating later in the day. Yeah, and there there are some groups in Australia as well that did both early and delayed eating within the same group and saw pretty much the same results. There were minor differences in the early Mm -hmm. group. I think one of the other confounds here is all of the trials that have done that have not been relative to an individual schedule. So they've been a set like clock hour in the day, which doesn't take into account when someone is waking up, when someone is going to sleep. 
Um, and it, you know, it kind of depends. Like some trials require that eating window to be a set 10 hours or eight hours for everyone in the trial, regardless of their schedule. Um, whereas others allow you to pick a schedule that works for you. And so what we've kind of seen when we allow participants to choose their own eating window, that it's not a matter of skipping any meals. It's just a matter of maybe delaying breakfast by an hour and advancing uh, dinner by a couple of hours rather than doing a full skip to some extreme that they wouldn't be able to stick to long term. So I know that, Emily, you've been on the show before and, and you explained our circadian rhythms in a lot of detail, but I think it will be important for us to kind of trace back over some of that. So when, when you're saying that eating at different times of the day can affect our health differently and this relates back to circadian biology, can you break that down for us, go right back to what our circadian rhythms are, this idea of a central clock, peripheral clocks, and how this kind of all ties together with meal timing? Yeah, I'll try to keep it short. <laughs> so ask more follow-ups. I'll really try to keep this one short because there's a lot we could go into. Um, the circadian system is really an anticipor- anticipatory system in your body that prepares your body to do whatever it would need to do. So it's going to help your digestive system kind of shut down and break down calories that you already have when you're sleeping so you can fuel yourself when it expects you to fast. It's going to predict when it should have a cortisol spike to help help you wake up. It's going to predict when your heart rate needs to be lower or your muscle strength needs to be stronger. You are functionally a different person at different times of day from every level, from behavior, um, you know, molecular structure, like anything that you would get measured at a doctor's office pretty much changes at different times of day, you know, hormone release, anything like that. Um, and we don't, you know, we have to take in cues from our environment. We all have about a 24 hour pattern of how all of these processes work to keep, you know, everything in the right place at the right time. But we coordinate these with the, with the environment. And the two main cues that we get are light and food. So light is going to be the biggest cue to talk to this clock in your brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is just a geographical term that sounds very complicated. Um, it's just where it's located. But that part of your brain will integrate light signals. It'll help control your uh, sleep-wake patterns. And it kind of talks to all the other clocks throughout your body. Um, and when I say clocks throughout your body, pretty much every cell in your body has a clock. Um, but when you eat actually directly affects each of those individual clocks directly because nutrition availability directly signals, uh, the cells to say what time of day it is. So if you're eating at the same time every day and you're fasting at the same time every day, your body can predict that it can have enzymes ready to digest things. It can help coordinate other things that are going on within the cell because food availability is a very strong cue to tell the cell what time of day it is. Whereas if you're eating at inoptimal times, you know, when your body wouldn't expect it, say the middle of the night, one, your insulin secretion is shut down. So you can't process your glucose properly Two, you're telling your body it's a different time of day. It may try to shift uh, those clocks directly. Um, like there's many different things that can kind of be um, kind of compromised as how your body would function just by when you're actually eating that food. So I'm just thinking about this and, and just throwing this out, out loud, but let's say it's 11 p.m. at night and it's dark. My central clock is, is re- detecting that or being regulated by that uh, change in light from light to, to darkness and anticipating that I'm about to go into a state of rest. But then let's say I go and eat a meal. Is it my... Is it the peripheral clocks that are then becoming disrupted? They're thinking that it's still time to be active and digesting whilst the central clock is saying, hey, it's time to rest and relax. And so you get kind of uh, a sort of uh, a loss of alignment between those two clocks. It's a, Yeah, it's a little bit like that. And it's also the, sorry, <laughs> it's a little bit that, Um, I mean, eating is a stimulation cue anyway. It's an arousal cue in its own regard. Like if you're driving late at night and you get tired, the first thing you do is start snacking and it'll help you wake up. So eating at the wrong time kind of sends a cue to your, your whole body that it's, it's the wrong time. Um, but like things like when you talk about it's getting dark, well, one of the things that happens at night when it's getting dark is melatonin is secreted. Melatonin directly um, inhibits insulin secretion. So say you have a milkshake in the middle of the night 
well, now your body can't process that glucose. You might get a really high spike in blood glucose and those kinds of things that are happening perpetually over and over again can lead to things like prediabetes or diabetes. Yeah. And the way you can kind of think about the misalign these misalignments between the clock is a really simple level. So, you know, if your central clock says it's dark outside, it's saying, okay, let's slow metabolism down. Meanwhile, you're eating, so your peripheral clocks are like, let's pick it up. So it's effectively like you get conflicting signals mm -hmm. and your metabolism is confused. So you get all kinds of problems in your metabolism. Mm -hmm. And when you said a calorie is not a calorie earlier, that's a, that's a statement that I know ruffles a lot of feathers. Um, and I just want to clarify. So, <laughs> so you're, you're not saying that the unit of energy is, is different what you're saying is at different times of the day, our body is utilizing that energy differently. Is that right? Yeah. So you're going to process it differently. How it's going to affect your system is different. So like, even if say you had a lot of lights on and you're skewed and your melatonin wasn't high for whatever reason, um, you're still sending a cue to your circadian clocks to say that it's a certain time of day, right? Like there's a lot of different pathways and we don't have enough time or detail to go into all of them, but there are dozens of molecular pathways that are directly affected by, you know, gaining, you know, by nutrient detection um, and that are affected by the circadian clock. And most of them are affected by both, like these work hand in hand. And so when you give this kind of conflicting cue, it throws the system off. And if you do it once, you know, the system's pretty robust. You don't, kind of phase shift overnight, you don't, you know, your body doesn't say, Oh, I got this at midnight. So now this is now 6pm. And I'm going to shift six hours in one day, like it doesn't do that. But when you have these erratic cues, like some days I start eating at 6am, and some days I start eating at 11. And some days I end eating at midnight, some days I end eating at five, like your body has no idea what time it is anymore. And those rhythms over time get completely dampened. And so all of those processes are not able, able to work properly. And so you're really just kind of compromising the overall mm. system. So today, are you of the view that this, this kind of chronic circadian disruption, and I've heard you use that terminology before, as opposed to say acute circadian disruption, which people experience when they fly to the other side of the world, are you of the view that this is a, an integral sort of contributing factor to, to chronic disease that we see today? And, and, to take that a step further, if you look back, let's say 100, 200, 300 years with whatever data we have access to, have we seen a, a change in our, our meal timing uh, over the years? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that that is definitely a kind of a underlying problem that we become very ignorant to. And when we had kind of the industrial revolution and, and around the clock ability to work and consume food and all of these things that we didn't have hundreds of years ago, we have started to kind of abuse the system that we had, you know, we didn't know we were doing. We just kind of thought, oh, this is available. I can do it now. Um, and we didn't realize how much we were hurting ourselves. Um, so I, I do think that's kind of a chronic overlying problem. Um, and I, I think, yeah, I, I, that's how I would say it. I think chronic circadian disruption is a big contributor to a lot of chronic diseases, um, whatever they may be. Uh, and the WHO now now classifies night shift work as a likely carcinogen, right? So that goes to show you how, how good the evidence is. And so would I be right that, uh, Courtney, you mentioned there that you don't think there's any sort of independent effects on lipids uh, at this stage with with uh, early time-restricted eating. You can correct me if I heard that wrong. But my, my read is that it does seem fairly consistent, or at least it's been reproduced a number of times, your study. And then I read a study, I think the first author was Robert Jones. That was a 2020 paper that looked at early time-restricted eating and insulin sensitivity. And then there was a, another study by Parr that I think was an Australian group. Again, saw some improvements in glycemic control does that appear to be the kind of metabolic, the, the, the most reproducible metabolic benefit of time-restricted eating independent of weight loss? And second part of that question, how does the early time-restricted eating compare to kind of later time-restricted eating if we're talking about, say, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. versus midday to 8 p.m., which I think a lot of people who are doing intermittent fasting are, are kind of that's their their protocol um 
do we know how those compare in terms of insulin sensitivity and, and glycemic control? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I would say for early time restricted eating, the most um, common result people find is an improvement in glycemic control. And it's something like 75% of all studies on early time restricted eating find an improvement in some aspects of glycemic control. And, you know, my lab did it with an oral glucose tolerance test. Other labs used other sophisticated procedures, but it's nice that different scientists using different methods have come to the same result. I'll say the second most common thing that we see, although it's not measured in a lot of study, studies, are improvements in blood pressure. And there have been some really elegant studies done in rodents where they find that when they eat earlier in the day, they actually excrete extra sodium and that in turn lowers their blood pressure. Um, and so we think those are the most kind of the most common benefits. Um, now, most studies on time restricted eating haven't looked at early time restricted eating. They've looked at you know, time restricted eating by skipping breakfast or just eating a little bit later in the day. Like Emily mentioned earlier, eating breakfast a little later, dinner a little earlier. Um, to my knowledge, there have been three studies comparing early versus later time restricted eating. So the one that Emily mentioned earlier, I think it was a one week long study in 15 men. And they found by and large, there were improvements in glycemic control in um, both the early and what they called delayed time restricted eating. So this was time restricted eating by, by skipping breakfast. And I think there was one, I think it was maybe fasting glucose that was a little better in the early time restricted eating group, but by and large, the benefits were really similar. Uh, more recently, there was a study out of Japan in 90 adults comparing early versus sort of middle of the day time restricted eating. So in this study, they were comparing, I think it was 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. versus 11. Um, starting after 11 and then ending eight hours earlier, it was a five-week study. And in this study, they found early time restricted eating was better than both the control condition and uh, midday time restricted eating for weight loss, insulin sensitivity, um, the diversity of bacteria in your gut, and then also for lowering inflammation. So they kind of had a ranking where early time restricted eating was better than midday time restricted eating, which was better than kind of eating throughout mm -hmm. the day. When when you say early time restricted eating and you talk about 8 a.m., I just want to kind of get clear on something. Do any of these studies uh, collect data to understand the average time that people wake up and therefore when that first meal is, how distant that is from from actually rolling out of bed. Are these people rolling out of bed and yes. they having their first bite straight away or is it a little bit delayed? Depends on the study. We measure it in all of our studies. And we when we say early time restricted eating, we usually define that as eating within a 10-hour period that ends before about 5 p.m. Um, all of our studies have been eight, six or eight-hour windows. Um, and we've always required our participants to start eating within one to two hours of waking up mm -hmm. or we've given them given them a fixed schedule but it depends a lot on the mm -hmm. study so there's no negative effect yeah. on glycemic control for example if you start that window as soon as you wake up i'm just thinking with regards to where melatonin cortisol other hormones are do you need to allow a certain amount of time and get light exposure before your body is geared up or are you kind of ready to go and, and you're getting optimal glycemic control straight away? Yeah, so great question. So um, the original data from the 1990s, we have Ed Van Cotter did a series of studies where she literally infused glucose just straight into people for 30 hours and looked at their blood sugar control. And she found even at 6 a.m. in the morning, they had better blood sugar control than later in the day or when they were sleeping. That said, you know, it wasn't a large study. And what we now know is about half of people have a genetic mutation in their melatonin receptors. And it take in those individuals who have a certain mutation, it takes a little longer for mel melatonin levels to fall in the morning. So my suspicion is in, in some individuals, it's better to get bright light exposure before you start eating. Mm -hmm. So maybe wait more like an hour or two after eating. But um, I don't think we have a super clear answer on this yet. Yeah, and, and in all of our studies where we let individuals choose when they want to eat they generally choose nine to seven or the latest we see is ten to eight sometimes eight to six um, but people usually don't go to an extreme and i don't think there are any studies out there that have compared saying eight to four versus nine to five is that really a significant difference and i i, I doubt that it would be i think the general idea is that you're eating when you're active and when you're awake sure. and sometimes when you do these 12 to eight 
things and you might be someone who's up and going at 6 a.m., that's where you really try to see some negative benefit, some negative effects of having it that much later in the day. But if you're someone who wakes up at 10 or 11 in the morning, which there are people that have circadian mutations that wake up Mm -hmm. later, then yeah, I wouldn't tell those people to try to wake up early to eat, you know, like they should fit to their body. So I think the general rule we like to think of is like, wait at least an hour after you wake up and stop eating at least three or four hours before you go to bed and then figure out what works for you. And if you're in that kind of zone, I don't think there's a huge difference between you know, one hour earlier or one hour mm-hmm. later. So in some ways early is kind of relative to your sleep cycle and, and when you wake up. Yeah, and I think one of the problems is that for people that might have to wake up very early to commute, um, maybe they have to wake up at 5 or 6 a.m. Maybe like I know school teachers sometimes have very early start times. They're forcing themselves to wake up very early. They're not even hungry yet. Melatonin is definitely still high and then they're mm-hmm. forcing themselves to eat I think that's where you get a problem with early mm-hmm. eating. Whereas if they gave the body a chance to wake up a little first before they ate, it would probably serve them a lot better. Sure. It does seem though that the majority of people, at least that, that I know who are doing in, intermittent fasting, are doing it from midday to 8 p.m. So mm-hmm. it would seem that in in theory at least, shifting that a little bit towards the earlier part of the day could be beneficial. But then... Mm-hmm. The question uh, that that follows is adherence and how would that be something that someone could implement into their lifestyle? And for example, if you're shifting your dinner from 8 p.m. down to 5 p.m., is that something that you can do socially? Does that work with your family, et cetera? And I'm sure that's something that both of you have, have thought about. Yeah, and in our we in our recent study, we did a pretty extreme schedule, so to speak. We tried um, a... 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. schedule and fast for the rest of the day. It's actually really interesting. We asked people at the end of the study, what do you what do you plan to do in the long term? And the control group, almost no one wanted to do the early time restricted eating. And about a quarter of people wanted to do time restricted eating by eating in the middle of the day. Um, I was actually surprised more people in the control group didn't want to try time restricted eating. But, you know, that's the data. Um, but among the people in the early time restricted eating group, we found 40% of them wanted to continue time restricted eating and early time restricted eating in some shape or form. So we're finding that once people try it, a significant, obviously this is not a majority of people, but a significant number of people want to continue with it. Mm-hmm. And in our particular study, we found benefits for mood. And so we're thinking, because they didn't know, you know, that they were, that they were getting any extra weight loss benefit while they're in this study, but obviously you can sense how you feel it. Mm. And our participants reported having higher energy levels and less fatigue and fewer feelings of depression and dejection. Um, And so we think there may be some benefits that might be appropriate for someone. Now, I doubt half the U.S. population is going to want to do early time restricted eating. So I always tell people, you know, this is really the million dollar question in the field, right? Mm. Exactly what time of day can you practice time restricted eating and and get benefits? Sure. Um, Yeah, I would agree. I think a slightly earlier in the day is beneficial, but I think the evidence is strong enough that any time restricted eating is better than not at all. So if you have to eat dinner at 7.30 p.m. because that's when your family eats dinner and that's really important to you, then yeah, Mm -hmm. I would do that. But does it have to be eight hours? Like, could you just eat 10 a.m. till 8 p.m.? Probably. I don't know that there's Mm -hmm. that much of an additional benefit there. I think, you know, and, and to Courtney's point that improved energy and decreased fatigue and increased mood was also seen in Sachin's paper in 2015. Um, even in those first few eight, that seems to be an across the board thing. Um, and I've also seen across the board in many different populations is that you have this decreased hunger. Mm-hmm. So it's not like people are starving during this period. They actually have decreased hunger overall. Again, probably because you're supporting the circadian system that it's allowing your body to mm-hmm. know when to rest. You you spoke there about adherence and something that comes to mind here and can be a little bit of a segue into discussing some of these more recent trials. Often TRE is kind of put up head to head with calorie restriction and, and we can go into whether that's a good idea or, or not. Um, but I, I wonder, is, is, is there any data out there that speaks to adherence and looks at the differences between being able to stick to time restricted eating and lose weight versus tracking calories uh, and losing weight that way? Well, some of the earliest studies on time-restricted eating, literally the participants were only told, just restrict your eating, don't worry about counting calories, you know, they weren't given any instructions to 
eat healthier, and they spontaneously lost weight. And in these studies, they were typically losing something like one to 4% of their body weight. So this is, you know, a significant amount. And so we have a really good, pretty solid body of evidence that when you tell people to restrict their food intake, they, they tend to lose weight. Now, if you combine that with calorie restriction, it kind of depends on the paradigm, right? So if you have a background, if you have a study that's pursuing very extreme calorie restriction, as Emily said earlier uh, today, it can be sometimes hard to detect differences uh, or additional weight loss benefits due to time-restricted eating because, you know, the participants are already aggressively losing weight. But most of the studies that have measured appetite or food intake have found that it helps people spontaneously eat less. Uh, so. Um, you know, I think there's probably a small benefit, but, you know, there for time restricted eating. And we're starting to see meta analyses that are now pulling the data across large numbers of studies. And they're kind of estimating that the average effect is about two, two percent weight loss relative to the control group. So not necessarily a large effect. And that effect kind of effect can get lost if you're having a very aggressive weight loss study where people are already losing like 10 percent of their body weight. Mm -hmm. So it's just harder sometimes to detect these differences in large studies. Yeah. And I think uh, I agree with everything you just said. I think along those same lines, like um, the paper that just came out a couple of days ago in obesity from uh, Corey Reidner's group, um, they even, there's a line in there that says like for the group that was doing both um, and they were struggling with caloric restrictions, so they told them to just focus more on time restricted eating and they still saw the same change. Right. So um, they also didn't have a huge difference between eating window within their participants um, but I, I do think one of the ideas is that some people might be able to do caloric restriction, but if everyone could do caloric restriction and exercise all the time, this would kind of be, a, mm -hmm. probably would never get to this point. Um, but time restricted eating is an alternate way to potentially see large health benefits. And I, again, I don't think that weight is the only way that you get those benefits. And I don't even think it's the main mm -hmm. outcome that I would look for, um, as a, as a benefit from time restricted eating. So with that in mind, this kind of idea that, that, or at least my assumption anyway, is that a number of people that are interested in time-restricted eating are interested in it because they either have tried counting calories and, and haven't been able to adhere to it or just don't feel like that's the right approach for them. And thus for them, the, the comparison is really between doing nothing and doing TRE. I wonder how you feel about some of these more recent studies where the time-restricted eating group is being compared to calorie restriction and often the time-restricted eating group is doing calorie restriction at the same time. I, just, I think they're interesting studies. I think it's nice to see that data. Um, I think the only point where it gets concerning to me is when the media oversimplifies it to a point where it's, it's a misleading message to say time-restricted eating has no benefits because Again, I don't think that's it's those studies really weren't aimed to answer the questions that we're really looking at. Um, I don't think anyone ever really thought that, you know, if you're on an extreme caloric restriction, which especially the New York, the um, NEJM paper, mm -hmm. they were achieving 35 percent caloric restriction in the first three months and then 25 percent at a year. That is far more caloric restriction than we see in caloric restriction studies in the U.S., like the calorie trials at 25% for a period and they were having 15% and they still saw benefits and weight loss of caloric restriction. So they did a great job. Mm -hmm. They also had two people, two staff monitoring people every single day. You know, Corey Reidner's group also had classes that people are going to. I mean, it's a very intensive behavioral intervention program to get people to follow caloric restriction. You're still only, you know, it, it's an intensive program. And if you do that and people are adherent, um, which both of these studies had pretty good adherence, then of course you're going to see weight loss with caloric restriction. Um, and to not see a significant difference beyond that with time-restricted eating, I don't find surprising at all. Um, and again, these participants are pretty young and healthy overall. And so you wouldn't see changes in other, you know, in, in things like glucose regulation mm -hmm. or blood pressure, which we do see in all of our other studies that with people that do have prediabetes or metabolic syndrome. Um, and so I don't find these uh, results shocking. I think it's really interesting to see that hey, an eight hour time restricted eating with caloric restriction is pretty much the same as a 10 hour or 11 hour time restricted eating with caloric restriction. Okay, mm -hmm. maybe that's a little bit easier than to sell someone just do 10 hours, your caloric restriction that way. There's no reason to force yourself into eight. Um, but beyond that, I don't think it, it is anything to say that time-restricted eating isn't effective at what we had kind of hypothesized that it would be. And I will also even add, I don't think we're, 
we're not yet at the point where we're doing very large studies to nail some of these questions definitively. I think if we had larger sample sizes, you know, we would be able to answer these questions more definitively. So, I mean, even if you think about the whole debate versus low, low versus high carb diets, right? To really answer that question, they have to go to studies where they're enrolling 600 mm-hmm. people, right? To definitively answer that question. We're still, most of our studies enrolling less than 100, mm-hmm. right? So in any weight loss study, you will have people who gain weight, even though right. they're supposed to lose weight, and then people who lose massive amounts of weight. So with that kind of variability, it's much harder to see, mm-hmm. you know, smaller or moderate differences mm-hmm. in weight loss. Yeah, and and on that example of low versus high carb, one of those di- uh, diet studies that stands out is the Diet Fit study from Christopher Gardner's group. Yeah. And one of the very interesting right. findings there was the variance within each group. So some people did really well on low carb and some yeah. did really That's well right. on high carb. And unless you looked at a waterfall plot, you missed a lot of that that variance Correct. that does show that even though the averages were the same, there is a particular benefit for certain individuals. And then I guess the next question is how do you test to kind of better predict who might do better with a, a certain intervention? Emily, you mentioned these two trials, uh, which I think we just spent a little bit more time on. And the, so the studies that I'm, I'm speaking to here are the Corey Rinders one, which came out of University of Colorado. I think that was just published in the last week or so. Uh, and then the, the one out of China published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is the one that sort of sparked the New York Times uh, article. Both of these studies are relatively similar, I guess, in, in design. Um, and these are the ones that I think might trip people up when they hear that time-restricted eating is, is not effective. And I know that you sort of spoke to some of the things in, the, in these papers, but I just want to spell things out a little bit more here. So what, what are the really important things to understand when it comes to, say, the, uh, the differences in eating window between the intervention group and the control group in these studies and also some of the, the kind of baseline, I guess, characteristics of the subjects that were included? Yeah. So I think one thing to note just from the baseline is none of these are time-restricted eating versus nothing. It's time-restricted eating with caloric restriction or caloric restriction alone. The second caveat to that is even the caloric restriction alone group was debatably a form of time-restricted eating. So in the NEJM paper, at baseline, the participants had a little bit over a 10-hour eating window, which I would consider an intervention of just time-restricted eating in its own right. Um, and then their their TRE group had about eight hours. So it is a little bit shorter, but it's really maybe about a two hour difference. Um, similarly, in the uh, Reidner's paper, um, they had, I think, around 11 hours at baseline. And even the caloric restriction group did decrease to about 10 hours. Um, and the time restricted eating group was a little bit shorter than that. But they, you know, it was only about an hour and a half difference between these two groups. So this wasn't like what we normally see where there's usually at least a four hour difference between a time restricted and a, and a um, kind of control group for that. These were really quite similar um, and none of them were beyond 12 hours. So I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. We're not talking about what kind of the median eating window we see in the U S which is about 14 plus hours. Mm -hmm. It's we're talking about kind of shorting eating anyway. So that's a a big confound to both studies. Um, the other thing is with the Reidner's papers, as, as Courtney had mentioned, I think they were younger in general. Um, and in both papers, the participants were already pretty healthy. They were overweight, but otherwise were pretty healthy. And so if you're looking for things like blood pressure changes or um, HbA1c, which is kind of an average blood glucose over the past three months or fasting glucose or even cholesterol, which fluctuates a lot based on diet, um, you're not going to see any really big changes in a group that has normal levels at baseline. And you just wouldn't expect to, there's not a lot of room to grow. You know, maybe this would be helpful for them. You know, maybe they'll do better 10 years from now if they stick to this, but we're not doing studies long enough to know that. Um, and so I think when you say, okay, well, time restricted eating isn't working. Um, I just don't see that because the assumption would be that time restricted eating helps you lose weight separate from decreasing calories Um, And potentially there could have been an added effect. And even within those papers, you do see a slight change between the two. They just aren't significant differences. And I think you get somewhat of a ceiling effect. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like 
if it's raining outside and the rain washed all the dust off your car and then you go through a, a car wash, well, okay, well, the rain kind of already got the dust off. Um, you're kind of hitting the same thing twice. Um, and so I wouldn't expect a big difference there. That doesn't mean the car wash doesn't wash your car better. Um, but you might not be able to see a difference there within these outcomes. Mm -hmm. And just building on that, the way I often think about it is I look at the weight of all evidence as well as the quality of the study, right? So generally what we find is the better the quality of the study, the more likely it is to find a, a benefit for time-restricted eating. About half of the studies find weight loss benefits. If you pull all that data, you get a statistically significant effect. Um, and then the other thing, there's a little bit of a, a media effect here, right? So the two, um, the two studies... Um, that recently came out with null results were published in JAMA Internal Medicine and the New England Journal of Medicine. Well, if you look at the top six largest studies on time-restricted eating, four out of six have found a positive benefit. It's just the two null results got in higher profile journals, right? Mm -hmm. So it gets more media attention. So, you know, the average reader will see those studies and think, oh, it's not working. But when you actually research the field on you know, a daily basis, you know all the studies, right? And so mm -hmm. you pull them together mentally in your head and you say, what does the data tell us? And if there weren't a genuine effect, on average, we expect only 5% of the studies to find an effect. So the fact that we see 50% of the studies find a benefit for weight loss, mm -hmm. to me at least suggests there's something there. Recently, I've been working with friend of the pod, Dr. Will Bolsowitz on his new brand, 38 Terra an evidence-based prebiotic supplement to optimize gut health. To facilitate online sales, 38 Terra uses Shopify. The major reason 38 Terra chose Shopify over other e-commerce platforms was because of Shopify's focus on customer conversion. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout up to 36% better compared to other leading e-commerce platforms. If you're going to spend time and money on marketing, you wanna make sure you are converting the people who visit your site into loyal customers. What I also love about Shopify is how, no matter how big you want to grow, Shopify gives you everything you need to take control in-house. The Shopify app store is home to thousands of customizable apps that can easily plug into your website to help with things like upselling, selling products on social media channels like Instagram and TikTok, and much more. To boost your conversion rate and grow your business, sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com forward slash proof. That's shopify.com forward slash proof, all in lowercase. One other trial that I'd like to speak to both of you about, and Courtney, I think you were referring to it. I think it was the one that was published in JAMA. This is the TREAT trial. I think that's the one that you were referring to. And I mentioned Ethan Wise uh, earlier, who was included in that New York Times piece. He seems to have been convinced that there's no benefit to, to TRE, and this was his trial. Uh, if my memory serves me correctly, it was a 12-week intervention. It was comparing a, a TRE group. It wasn't early TRE uh, versus a group that was given some advice around structuring meals over the course of a day. They seemed to, to find no significant difference in, in weight loss. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on this trial and, and what it does tell us, what it doesn't tell us? Yeah, absolutely. So they were comparing eating three meals a day. That's what the control group did. And the control group was required to eat breakfast every day versus effectively skipping breakfast, starting eating at 12 p.m. and finishing eating at 8 p.m. And they found no benefit for weight loss. And also participants lost a little bit of lean mass that was an amount that we would consider clinically significant. So I think, I mean, this is where it's really important to look at all of the research that's been done on meal timing. So there are a bunch of, about a handful of studies out of Japan that have done these very carefully controlled studies where they compare eating three meals a day versus uh, skipping breakfast and eating two meals a day. And in all of those studies, they find that skipping breakfast and then, you know, eating um, at lunchtime and at dinner time that that actually raises glucose levels across the day. So at least in the short term, you know, the data we have on, on uh, glycemic control suggests that actually skipping breakfast and eating two meals is worse. Now, in their particular study, you know, this is where you start asking questions of like, okay, they're eating in a shorter duration, um, but they're also eating significantly later in the day. They weren't necessarily moving um, um, both, you know, breakfast a little later and dinner a little earlier. And in fact, if you actually dig really deep in that, in that paper, you'll actually find that the group that did time-restricted eating starting to go to bed later. 
So this is suggesting they're eating significantly later in the day. So I suspect they didn't find an effect in any endpoint just because we know that there have been studies that show if you tell people eat meals at regular times, um, that that actually improves their uh, cardiovascular health um, mm-hmm. and their metabolic health. So, right. So again, the control group is not a no intervention group. It's definitely an intervention group. And in fact, some of the benefits of time restricted eating may be due to fasting duration, some due to the time of day, and then some do the regularity of meals. So when I think about meal timing studies, I think about all those different aspects and how they interact together. So you just have to consider them, you know, um, together. So my suspicion is because they forced the control group to eat so much earlier in the day, that may have wiped out any benefits from time restricted eating. I don't know if Emily will agree with me, but that's my take on that. Yeah, no, I agree with those points. And and one thing I wanted to bring up, so that same group from Israel, from Oren Frey's group, um, you know, they did a lot of really interesting work on timing of eating. And and we've mainly been talking about duration, but the phase, which is kind of getting it early or late, like what time of the day you eat, the regularity of when you eat. So how much variability you have, as well as the frequency of when you eat, you know, are you eating 16 times a day? Are you eating three times a day or two times a day? All of those things are timing of eating and all of those things affect health. Um, And their group also has shown really nice studies showing that if you're just skipping a meal, if you skip breakfast, you do have a higher glucose response to your first meal in the afternoon, just like, you know, Courtney had kind of mentioned. So again, I think that is one, one big part of it. Um, and it's something really important to think about when you are trying to figure out the right schedule for you. I think regularity of, of eating time. Um, and, you know, even in our studies where they did have a regular eating window, we actually saw that their sleep um, started to become more regular as well. Like it does seem mm-hmm. like there's this kind of downstream effect. Um, the other issue that I have um, with a JAMA paper from Ethan Weiss's group is half of the participants were done remotely where they never actually met with the clinic. They were able to sign up online. Um, which is a great way for reaching out to different populations. But with every pro like that, you have a con as well, in which case, if you actually look at the adherence, the people who did respond had a pretty high adherence, but only about 24% of the responses that they would have expected came in. So there was a lot of unknown of if people are actually doing the intervention itself. And they had half of the participants who did come into the clinic and they saw better results yeah. than those who didn't come in. And so I think whenever you're doing a behavioral intervention, they're usually pretty intensive. You know, if you look into caloric restriction or other dietary interventions, they frequently entail having like support groups where you have to come in and talk about it and all these other things to be able to get that. And then that never happens in time restricted only studies. The only times I've seen it are really when you have it um, like in these last two papers that p- paired it with caloric restriction or with Courtney's work where they're actually coming in and eating with you. But even then it requires a lot of work to get that. So yeah. without giving as much interaction with the participants, time restricted eating has actually seen pretty similar results, which I think is pretty shocking in its own right. But if you don't have any interaction with your participants, I don't think any behavioral intervention, you would really expect to see much of a change. So Again, I think that's a pretty big caveat to that finding, and it's important to keep in mind. The other thing I'd like to say just for looking at any time-restricted eating study is many of them don't even look at what the eating window is at baseline. <laughs> Luckily, more, that's become more common, but that's kind of like saying we're going to do caloric restriction, but I don't know how many calories you eat right now. Mm. Like, what are you comparing it to, right? And so I think the quality of, of papers has has gone up a lot. And I think this field was trying to figure out what it was exactly and, and take those things into consideration. But some of the papers that don't find any findings also did not really document when they were eating very well, or it was just on a survey after the fact um, on self-reporting, which are, are pretty big caveats to know when someone is actually eating. And it it makes it hard to test the mm-hmm. efficacy of the intervention itself. Yeah. And I just want to build on one thing you said, right? So kind of buried in the manuscript, the, the, they had half of the participants come in for their assessments in person. And those who came in for their assessments in person, there was a statistical trend towards an improvement in weight loss. So yeah, go figure, <laughs> right? The participants who actually got yeah. a little more handholding or touch actually were more adherent and lost a little more weight. Yeah. You, you brought up the the idea of skipping breakfast again there and potentially the negative effects this could have on blood glucose control. And uh, I'm not sure if the group in Israel you were speaking to then is the same one we were talking about earlier in this conversation. But 
it may seem counterintuitive to people who perhaps are skipping breakfast and let's say they're doing it because it allows them to just have two meals. They have their lunch and their dinner and they're thinking, well, that will help with my caloric intake and help me with my health and, and, and weight loss. Can you talk a little bit more to some of these breakfast studies and what we know about the benefits of having more food at the beginning of the day? Yeah, I think a lot of the breakfast, um, you know, breakfast is the most important, gets a little bit convoluted. And sometimes they're confounded by the fact that people who skip breakfast tend to eat later yeah. um, or tend to binge eat later at night. And if you just look at that factor, that seems to be the biggest concluding thing. So I think some of that is taken away when you do make sure you are stopping at 8 p.m. That being said, I think this kind of gets back to the circadian component of this, where you want to be taking in food when your body is active and moving and can process that food and not at the end of the day when you're going to be sitting down and probably be sedentary pretty much for the rest of the day. Um, And all of the studies that have looked at, you know, even in rodent models, it really the key has been is to eat during your active zone. And it sounds kind of overly simple, but I think that's kind of how I look at it. So I would say if you do, if you're awake for a very long period of time and you're not eating, I think that does kind of alter how your body is going to respond to your first food intake. And I think that's what some of these studies have shown. Um, And what we both kind of talked about is that that first meal can have compromised glucose regulation. Whereas having something in the morning, um, even if it's maybe not a huge breakfast, some people don't like a big breakfast, I would say then have a big lunch. But I think saying having a a really small breakfast or a small lunch and then binge eating at night, I think we've kind of seen across the board from many different fields that that's really not the way to go. And pushing most of your calories to the first half of your day is really ideal. Um, and again, if you get into the nitty gritty of it, I think it is probably eat breakfast, like a King lunch, like a queen dinner, like a popper, whatever the kind of idiom is. But, um, I think, you know, even if you just had it in the first half of your day, you'll see most of the benefits there. And then to have a dinner that's, you know, high fiber, high, you know, healthy proteins and fats and not as high in carb. I think there's some interesting studies that have come out there too. Um, especially, I mean, this is a whole other topic now, but looking at types of foods that you're eating mm-hmm. at different times of day, or if you do have to eat late at night because of certain shift work schedules, controlling the macronutrients of that might have big effects. And I think that's also where the field is going. So even if you can't stick to a specific window, the timing of macronutrients, I think is also very important. And again, there's many different aspects of food timing, but duration is, you can encompass many of them and is a bit easier to stick to. I want to highlight two studies from that group that, at least for me, just kind of blew my mind when they first came out. So uh, the group led by Daniela Jakobowitz and Oren Freud in Israel, they've done about a handful of studies testing the old adage of eating breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and dinner like a pauper. So two of the ones that really blew my mind is first, they did a study in 2015 where they took individuals with type 2 diabetes. And they did, again, they did a control, what's called a controlled feeding study where they provide all the food and they make sure that the participants... Um, when they're trying the two different eating schedules, they're eating the exact same food. They were able to show in one of these studies that after only one week of front-loading your calories to breakfast and lunch, that they were able to reduce mean glucose levels across the day. And not only did they reduce mean glucose levels, but they actually increased insulin secretion, which is huge because we know when you have type 2 diabetes, that actually compromises your beta cells ability to produce insulin. And over time, they actually die. So they showed with only one week, they can improve the functioning of those beta cells and produce more insulin. So amazing. And then the second study that they did that really blew my mind is they did a study in 60 women with PCOS who were struggling with fertility. So they weren't ovulating and they didn't allow their participants to lose weight, but they still had to follow these two eating schedules. And after about three months, the uh, group that was eating a large uh, breakfast, about 50% of the women started ovulating again versus only 20% in the control group. So this is pretty impressive. And what we know now is some of the same circadian clock genes that are involved in, well, some of the same genes that are involved in producing these 24 hour rhythms and our metabolism physiology also produce rhythms that are shorter Mm. and longer than 24 hours, including the menstrual cycle. So um, I just think it's so cool how everything comes Mm -hmm. full circle. Do you think there would be any difference in doing your training in the fasted state let's say for example i am doing the uh the kind of 9 a.m to 7 p.m type eating window would i be better be better doing my training before 9 a.m before i start eating or during the fed state 
I'm glad you asked this question. So the NIH has signaled they want to fund this type of research. Uh, so they just did a workshop and I, I participated in it. So they actually, there's some really provocative evidence there that suggests that the time of day that you exercise matters as well as the time of day that you eat. So there have been a couple suggestive studies and some of these were what we call post-hoc analyses, which means you do the study, you know, you find people lose weight and you go back and you say, okay, what are the factors that predict whether people lose weight? So a couple of these studies have found that people who exercise before breakfast, so in the fasted state, lose more weight. Mm -hmm. um, and there have been also some short-term studies that have looked at food intake, how, you know, so how much someone eats. If they exercise before or after breakfast, they've been able to show that, you know, at least acutely people tend to eat less and or their reductions in appetite hormones such as ghrelin. Um, that said, conversely, there's also data uh, suggesting that for individuals with type 2 diabetes, they get a much better benefit for their metabolism when they exercise in the afternoon. So I know that sounds a little bit confusing, but it may in part be due to the fact that they have a different optimal time of day for their circadian rhythms. And we know that, for instance, because usually their best blood sugar controls a little later in the day, unlike the average person without type 2 diabetes where, the, you know, your blood sugar control is better earlier in the day. And so for them, they don't seem to get as much benefit if they're exercising in the morning and they get a lot more benefit if they exercise in the afternoon. So it's super fascinating because no one can quite yet reconcile these different results. But nonetheless, they suggest there's an optimal time of day for exercise, and it may depend on the person what that optimal time of day is. Yeah, just another yeah, reminder I, I that these these protocols are going to to come down to who you are in many cases. Yeah. Absolutely. This goes into precision medicine, and I think it's also what you're trying to achieve um, is a big part of when you would exercise because there are circadian patterns to muscle strength, your heart rate is going to be changing differently throughout the day. Your blood pressure is different throughout the day. So if you're trying to do your absolute best, you're going to be better in the afternoon. If you're trying to lose weight, like right. you said, morning might be better. So depending on what you're trying to do uh, really matters on when you should work out. And there, like Courtney said, there's a lot of uh, research just starting up in this field. I think it'll be, we'll be seeing a lot more in the next few years. Yeah. And I think one of the big questions we have at the moment that we don't even know is does the time of day, like relative to your circadian rhythm matter more, or is it training in the postprandial versus fasting state? Mm -hmm. So even very fundamental questions like that that we don't know the answer to yet. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I have a couple of other little questions as we approach the end of this conversation. What breaks the fast? If, if I wake up at 7 but my eating window is going to start at 9 a.m., based on Emily's advice, uh, if I have a, a coffee, and let's just say that's a double espresso, there's no milk or cream or anything added to it, is that coffee going to open up my eating window? So we've generally said, yeah, we've generally said no. There is debate in the field, right? So not everyone agrees on this. So the, the approach we have taken is if there are any calories in it, it breaks your fast. Obviously, if it's like, two calories, yeah, probably not, right? But if you start talking about 50 calories, yes, um, absolutely, right? So human bloodstream contains about 10 to 20 calories at a time, depending on your body weight. So that kind of gives you a sense of the scale. Um, that said, there's also some data that caffeine can uh, activate cyclic AMP and may affect your uh, metabolism. And I'll let Emily speak mm -hmm. to that because I think you all might have a different uh, full philosophy or best guess on this. Yeah, uh, not that different. I think um, when yeah. we started this in humans, um, yeah. we went off of what we knew in rodents, which they were only on water. And we really didn't know if caffeine or artificial sweeteners or other things like that would have an effect. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's been any study to do a full time restricted eating plus coffee in the morning or <laughs> plus tea or plus this to say it does or doesn't have an effect. Um, like Courtney said, um, caffeine can trigger some things. Um, cyclic AMP also feeds into the circadian clock. It can also shift things that way. Um, it changes your arousal system, which can also have effects on behavior, which could indirectly shifts clocks. There's also been um, some studies shown that if you have caffeine before a meal, you can have a higher glucose spike in response mm -hmm. to your first meal. Um, in our studies, we have not allowed coffee um, or anything other than water. We've uh, allowed like a slice of lemon in water or an herbal tea if necessary. We've we've tried to kind of stay purists merely because we don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I think more would need to be known there. The one exception we had to that was in a, a study um, that we're just finishing <laughs> the revision on um, was in firefighters who were 24 hour shifts. And we did allow them to have coffee outside of their window if they needed to just for safety concerns, because they're working 24 hour shifts multiple days in a row. So if they felt like they needed coffee, we would let them have that. That being said, most of them decrease coffee anyway, but um, we didn't, we tend to not, but I think the, the data is still out, but even in the study, many studies have allowed coffee, like a black coffee and they still see benefits. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just in terms of uh, a kind of takeaway for the person listening, safest option mm -hmm. to include tea, coffee, stevia, any kind of low calorie thing within the eating window, it might be okay outside, but you think that we need a little bit more research? That's that's my view on it. I think if you need your black cup of coffee, that's not the worst thing. But if you can keep it in your eating window, I would I would try to do so. And Courtney, do you have a slightly different view on that? No, I just don't think we have enough data. Okay. Um, and we've just been more generous in my studies um, and let people drink coffee at any time of day. And you mentioned shift workers, and I, I know this could take us down a rabbit hole, but Emily, you and I spoke about this <laughs> okay. previously. Uh, Courtney, you mentioned earlier that I think I think you mentioned that shift work is associated with chronic diseases. Clearly, shift workers are, are very, very important people. We rely on them in very uh, many parts of our society. I'm wondering, since our last conversation, Emily, which was probably a couple of years ago now, has there been any further research looking at shift workers? What uh, types of protocols or strategies that people can perhaps lean into from a meal timing point of view that may help them nurture their circadian rhythms despite these kind of more uh, irregular working hours? Yeah, so our, our paper in, in shift and uh, twenty four hour firefighters is is coming out uh, soon, um, but there is really feasibility. Um, it was the main outcome, but also looking at other health outcomes, um, and we do see that it's feasible. We didn't see any adverse side effects, so they didn't have hunger problems or anything like that, which was nice to see. But in all fairness, twenty four hour shift work is the easiest shift work to do a time restricted eating regimen on because their night is still their night. They're able to try to sleep at night. They get woken up many times and it's not the same quality of sleep, but they're still awake during the day always, which is very different than say a night shift schedule where you're trying to sleep during the day and you're um, eating at night um, and you're awake at night. Um, and I think there's a lot of debate there and I'm very excited where that field is going. There's some really exciting work from Australia um, coming out, actually looking at different macronutrients throughout the night. So there were some cool studies done where they either gave um, like biphasic eating. So you ate kind of twice a day, maybe about 12 hours apart, and you didn't eat across the night at all. And you'd have better glucose regulation in the morning than if you had a full meal in the middle of the night. And the compromise in between where they gave them half that meal, they had like half the improvement. Um, and so I think one of the things shifting there is saying, okay, well, maybe it's not a good idea to have a large bowl of pasta in the middle of the night as your meal when you're on a night shift, but maybe switching to lean fats, higher protein, lower carb might be able mm -hmm. to help that. But that is such a young field um, and a lot more needs to be done there to see how we can say, okay, one, is it possible to stick to something like time restricted during your day when you are active during the day for something like a 24 hour uh, shift worker? And then, you know, it's going to be different for every other shift. And there's so many different types of shift work. A nurse is going to be different than a news anchor is going to be different, you know, like all these different things and some of them move. And so I think that's where the field is going. And I think controlling types of foods that you eat is going to be the compromise to say, what can we do to mediate mm. the risks and mediate the damage as much as we can? And sometimes that's going to be time restricted eating. And sometimes that's going to have to go down more into the types of foods that you're eating. Sure. What would you do if, if you all of a sudden had to work 10 p.m. to 6 a.m.? That mm. was your regular kind of sh shift overnight. And so you were up and awake while it was dark and you would come home after your after you clock off at 6 a.m. and perhaps go to bed at 8 a.m., what would you, how would you set up your meals? Yeah, that's, that's rough. Um, and this is very anecdotal because we don't have mm -hmm. a good answer for this. And some rodent trials have tried and it, it, it's mixed. Um, I think I would 
and the, one of the big problems is because you switch back and forth between being awake mm-hmm. during the day and being awake at night. And that's one of the really big problems there. Um, and humans who do try to stick to always being awake at night, that doesn't usually work. So you're switching back and forth. One idea is to try a biphasic eating where maybe I eat at eight and eight every day. And it's just, it doesn't matter if it's daytime or nighttime. And then maybe on my days off, I could also eat during the daytime when I'm active. Um, and I'd probably have, if I'm really hungry while I'm working, I'd have like some nuts, Mm -hmm. like a handful of like almonds or something like that. That's really not going to trigger any type of glycemic response. Um, the other option would be to try to stick to some kind of, you know, 10 hour eating during the day, but I don't think that makes sense because then you're not going to get enough, like you're going to be awake for too long and before you get to eat again. So I think if I had my first go, I would probably try a biphasic, Mm -hmm. but that is, um, you really, I think have to test it out and see what works for you and then adjust. And the data just really isn't there to say what is best. And it, there are such hard trials to run and there's so many different types of shift work. Um, that it's something that I'm very interested in. And I think we really do need to do. I mean, I completely agree with you. The shift work population are key. I mean, we even titled our study, the healthy hero study, mm-hmm. because they are the heroes of our society. Um, and so I think finding ways to help them mediate the disruption to their circadian system is huge. Um, and so I really want to go down that path, but there's, there's still a lot to know before I can say, do this, it'll work. We just don't know yet. Let- let me add two things on top of that. So Frank Shear's lab just came out recently with a study where they took individuals and had them kind of simulate doing night shift work. And they what they ended up testing was if you're doing night shift work, is it better to eat during your shift in the middle of the night or is it better to eat during the daytime? And in that study, they actually found it was better for their glycemic control to actually eat during the daytime than mm-hmm. on their shift. Now, the big caveat for these studies is these were not individuals who habitually did shift work. And we do know from short-term studies of shift work that we do see adaptation over time, right? So this may not generalize to people who chronically do shift work. Again, distinction between yeah. acute and mm-hmm. chronic. But I will say I do know right now there is a group, Jos- Josie Brossard's group um, at UC Boulder, I believe, is um, mm-hmm. studying whether time-restricted eating can be a countermeasure. So in other words, can it um, kind of lessen the side effects of night shift work? What as of today, do you think it is safe for us to say about time-restricted eating and its utility for for human health? And what do you think are the remaining gaps where we have some hypotheses, but we need future research to to kind of help tease things out a little bit more? Yes. I, um, I think the general finding is one, it seems to be safe. I think that's one important thing. There have yet to see any serious adverse effects in shorter than eight hour eating windows. So it does seem to be safe even for those who have type two diabetes. So I think that's been um, an exciting finding to know that this is something that people can do, at least within adults, there hasn't been much done in children yet. Um, I think the other thing is that we have seen across the board um, in most studies that if you do have compromised glucose regulation, that this can be an effective way to help improve your glucose regulation, even if you're not losing large amounts of weight, even if you don't change your diet. Now, not that you shouldn't, I think these are complementary things, Um, but I see time restricted eating as a healthy component of eating. It's not just what and how much, but also when you eat, it's going to control how your body processes that food and how that food is going to affect your overall health. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting work to be done in the cardiometabolic field and in the inflammation field. So in things such as cancers and how people are going to be able to respond to that. As far as cardiometabolic, there's been mixed findings on cholesterol and triglycerides. Um, and I think some of them have not been maybe sophisticated enough tests. I think if you get into other type of lipo profiles where you can see breakdowns of different types of cholesterol, there might be some interesting things there um, or even inflammation around arteries that could change, that could change prognosis. So I think there's more to be done in that field to really understand the cardiovascular benefits, but I think it's, I've seen a lot of evidence to show that you can really improve glucose regulation by just simply controlling the timing of when you eat. And so I think that's where we can take it now. And then moving that into more cardiovascular as well as inflammation fields to see how it can help those diseases. And then the thing that's very hard to test is how it could be used preventatively as how it could be part of a healthy lifestyle for anyone to implement to Mm -hmm. potentially, hopefully at least delay the onset of chronic disease. 
Yeah, and I'll say from my perspective, I think we're a little further away from public health recommendations. So what we need are either larger meta-analyses or we need like the one large definitive study, you know, with hundreds of participants where we demonstrate, um, you know, that time-restricted eating has benefits for weight loss. That's probably the number one thing that people want to know. And we will need something like that before we can make public health recommendations with the field being mixed, you know, about 50-50. Unfortunately, no dietary guidelines committee is going to recommend TRE yet. Um, they probably want to see a randomized controlled trial, not just a meta-analysis uh, showing there's an effect. Um, I will say recently we just did a, completed a study and we were estimating the effect um, in terms of not only the weight loss, but sort of calories per day, that it reduces um, how much you eat by. And we found about a 236 calorie difference. So that's not necessarily... A large effect, but I still call that a modest to moderate effect. So I would also say we also need to kind of characterize the size of the effect. Now, it's very easy to say that, but as I think Emily did such a good job earlier explaining how different study designs can lead to different effects, right? If we ask people to eat in a six-hour window, they're probably going to eat less than if it's a 10-hour window, right? So mm. just also understanding, you know, what are the optimal fasting durations that, you know, what fasting durations pr produce what size of a weight loss benefit, which fasting durations can people stick with? What times of day can people stick with? And one study that my lab is doing is we're actually comparing early versus middle of the day time restricted eating in the setting of a controlled feeding study. So do we see, you know, what's the relative benefit of early versus later in the day and kind of teasing apart what people can do? And then the last thing is having longer trials, right? Mm -hmm. So we need studies now that, you know, follow people out for a full year. Let's let's slide over to to time restricted eating. So I'm interested in where this kind of enters this conversation with regards to our circadian biology. You know, how what a how many hours across the day does the average person right now, say in America, eat, and how is this uh, affecting circadian biology? Yeah. So the concept of uh, eating within a certain Hours. So it relates to circadian biology in many different ways. One is our digestive system is primed to um, digest. So the overall idea is just like our brain can stay awake during daytime, solve complex math, and then wants to sleep at night to repair, reset, and rejuvenate, almost every organ in our body also has a peak time when it can perform much better and need some downtime to repair, reset, rejuvenate. That's the overarching principle. So now if we look at every single aspect of our digestive system, you know, um, when we eat something, it has to be digested in our stomach and there has to be a lot of acid secretion and then digestive juice, all the enzymes have to be secreted so that the food gets digested. It takes almost five hours to digest a good sized meal uh, for example, breakfast, lunch, or dinner. So now, um, let's start our math from the from the night time. Suppose say one eats around say eight o'clock at night. Although we finish eating at eight by eight eight fifteen, the stomach continues to work for the next five hours to digest that food. So that means around one o'clock or one thirty in the morning. That's when the stomach is finally getting some downtime to go to go to repair, reset, and rejuvenate. Right. And our stomach lining um, needs to repair nearly 7 to 10% of the cells that line the stomach. So there's a good amount of repair that happens. Mm -hmm. And then um, our, our lower, lower intestine, uh, the food moves in our digestive system because of this peristaltic action because the uh, the muscles contract and expand, so that's how the move when the food moves. Uh, but that action also slows down and also almost stops because the intestine needs to sleep. So as a result, the food actually doesn't move much. Um, so some of you, some of us who, when we eat late at night, next day we feel like the food is not digested, and it's not just a feeling. Actually, the food doesn't get digested properly because the peristaltic movement stops. So now, uh, if we think that your st 
stomach, just like our brain, needs seven to eight hours of downtime to repair. So that means if you eat at eight o'clock and if your stomach gets a break at one o'clock in the morning, for the next seven to eight hours, it needs that downtime so that it can repair itself. Then one should not eat until at least nine o'clock in the morning next day. So that's the simple math just for the just from the stomach point of view. And there are many other uh, there are many other aspects of our uh, digestion, nutrient accum- uh, assimilation, and that essentially tell us that we should be eating uh, for no more than twelve hours in a day, because. Mm-hmm. We need that five hours of digestion after the last meal and then seven to eight hours of repair and rejuvenation to be ready for the next day. Mm. And how, how long is the average person currently eating over? What's a typical eating window if you were just to go and grab the average American? Yeah, so another point is we don't eat the same at the exact same time every day. So, for example... I'll give you an example and you can actually give me the answer. I'll give, give you some example and then ask you a question. So, for example, suppose say I eat today, I eat my breakfast at 6 in the morning. Tomorrow it will be 6.15. Day after tomorrow it's 5.45. Another day, maybe 8 o'clock or 7 o'clock. And um, if somebody asks you, hey, Simon, uh, when does Sachin actually typically eat breakfast or when does his circadian system, she expects to eat food, then the answer would be around six o'clock um, because one day maybe I ate at 5.45, but usually around six o'clock, 6.15, 6.30. So now if we do the same math and then take two weeks of food data from somebody and then ask what is the probable time window in which this person is likely to eat 90 plus percent of its meal, then the number that we get is 14 hours, 45 minutes. So nearly half of the mm-hmm. adults in the U.S. who are not doing shift work, because for shift workers, it's even worse. Um, nearly 50% of adults eat for 14 hours, 45 minutes or longer. Mm-hmm. Less than 10% of people actually eat consistently within 12 hours or less. So that mm-hmm. means there is room for improvement for almost all of us <laughs> to improve our health just by paying attention to when we eat or when we stop eating. Right. And you, you said it takes about five hours to sort of digest the last meal that you have at the end of the day. And then after that, you need about seven to eight hours to, to kind of get that repair process happening. Um, can you just define a little bit deeper what what repair means. Is this where things like autophagy I often see sort of brought into this conversation? Um, is this where processes like that sort of come in? Yeah, so there are many types of repair. Um, so let's start with the gut because during during the day we eat a lot of different stuff and then there is also uh, enzymes and acids that are secreted and we damage nearly eight to 10% of our stomach lining. And you can think of this as the uh, your highway or the road, or you can think of the cobblestone road where you take out eight to 10% of the stones every day and they have to be repaired. They have to be physically replaced. And the way that happens is growth hormone from our pineal gland is secreted. And actually the secretion goes up with two signals. One is fasting. And second is our uh, deep sleep. Mm -hmm. So if we haven't eaten for several hours and if we're in our deep sleep, then the growth hormone is secreted. That gives a signal to the stomach lining to divide and replace these damaged cells or uh, dead cells. And this is a very uh, relatable repair process that we can think of. And similarly, in the brain, when we sleep, then... Many of our um, our toxins, brain toxins, they do get secreted into the outside of the cell. It's almost like taking the trash can out and leaving it outside for the for the uh, for the truck to come and pick it up. So that also happens. So that's like taking the toxin literally out of the body. 
Mm-hmm. And you also mentioned autophagy and autophagy also occurs after several hours of fasting. So that's internal, almost like recycling process within the cell. So all mm-hmm. three types of repair where you are recycling within the cell, taking the trash out outside the cell, and even replacing the entire cell when it is damaged all these three types of repairs happen uh, during our fasting plus sleep time mm-hmm. and so you said we we should aim for at least 12 hours of period without fasting. food right yeah. um so what would you if we were to kind of just at this point before we keep going, if, if we were to kind of define what you think is the optimal eating window and, and sort of translate that into what that looks like in, in the standard person's um, daily life. So not a shift worker, just a standard person. What would that look like in terms of um, the time that someone, say, wakes up, their breakfast, lunch, dinner, and bedtime? Yeah, so let's start with the bedtime because your next day actually begins when, with when you go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so try to be consistent in going to bed and then try to be in bed for eight hours so that you can get seven hours of sleep. And then after waking up, one should wait for at least an hour or two before eating anything with calories because mm-hmm. that's the time when our sleep hormone melatonin goes down, and our cortisol rapidly rises and reaches its peak and then slowly adjust its, itself and um, our insulin function our insulin secretion is adversely affected by both process insulin uh, sorry by melatonin as well as high level of cortisol so that's why one should avoid food for one to two hours in the morning and then have your breakfast at a consistent time because since our clocks get synchronized with each other and with the outside world Um, by two signals, light and food. And actually, over the last five to 10 years, what we are seeing is food is a much more stronger signal for all our peripheral organs than light. Light is a very good signal for brain, but food is very strong for the rest of our body. So um, Mm -hmm. so eat your breakfast, the first meal uh, that has calories at a consistent time. And then try to eat all your meals in the next... 8, 10, or maximum 12 hours. And in most of our clinical studies, we target 10 hours because 8 hours is a little bit difficult for long-term compliance. If somebody can do 8 hours for a month, 2, or 3, that's fine. But many of us cannot do it for uh, for our rest of our life. So mm-hmm. it's a good goal to have 10 hours. So that okay. once in a while you can eat within eight hours and once in a while if you if you cannot and go towards 11 or 12, you are not actually breaking, mm-hmm. uh, not doing too much damage. So that's why 10 hours is an ideal target. So an example of that could be 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. That, yeah, that might work to well. Yeah. Um, okay, I've got a couple questions on, on a few things there. So one that comes up and a lot of people sent me this, Sachin, was – Okay, within that fasting period in the morning, before you have that first meal, would things like supplements or medications or tea, coffee, let's say black coffee, um, would they be permitted within that? I mean, no one's no one's watching, but I'm thinking from a biological yeah. point of view. Um, yeah. are, they, are they going to interrupt these biological repair mechanisms that you mentioned or would they be okay to have in that fasting period? So again, this is a question that we cannot do any clinical trial or systematic study, even in animals. We cannot feed animal coffee every day before we give them milk. But this is where we got to use some common sense and uh, arrive at. So there are many medications that need to be taken with empty stomach. So so people should continue to take those in empty stomach. Best example is thyroid medication. Uh, People who are taking levothyroxine that should be taken in empty stomach in the morning. So that's fine. Sure. Uh, where it kind of becomes gray zone is coffee, coffee with a little bit of people will say, I just put half a teaspoon of sugar or a little bit of cream just to make it palatable. And um, one thing is it, it relates to what is your goal. 
if your goal is to lose weight or maintain your blood glucose level uh, then maybe a mild coffee or tea is is okay so that's why we say there are three exceptions to the rule one is if your job depends on it uh, for example there are a lot of shift workers they have to wake up early in the morning they have the morning shift they have to uh, be fully alert and for them tea or coffee is kind of um, <laughs> having a job or no job for example if you're a tv presenter you have to be awake second is uh, for public safety you should not be driving on the road uh, sleepy it's better to mm-hmm. be a little bit caffeinated and then the third one is if you really cannot function without coffee that's the only love in your life then you can have it but here is the um, thing how it affects so there are a lot of people who cannot drink strong coffee or tea for long term in empty stomach because that can lead to acid reflux um or even panic or anxiety attack because they just the body cannot tolerate the strong coffee so if you are one of them then um try to see whether you can reduce your caffeine dose or if you can delay that for an hour or two and have it after breakfast in fact in many in turkey um the literal meaning of breakfast means the meal uh, the meal before coffee because mm-hmm. a lot of people can have acid reflux in empty stomach now let's come back to the physiology and see what is breaking a fast or what affects your cl- um, body so that your insulin production and everything else begins to start so if you take me and drain all of my blood and figure out how much blood sugar i have then uh, the official blood sugar level for somebody healthy is it should be less than 100 mg per 100 ml mm. so that means if you find 5 liters of blood that is the average blood that you will find from a person like me then i have 5 grams of sugar in my blood and if it goes to 6 grams then it will be 120 mg per 100 ml and you diagnose me as pre diabetic and if i have 7 grams then i am diabetic because my fasting blood glucose will be 140 so that means if you add just 2 grams of sugar half a teaspoon of sugar to your coffee or tea uh that can raise your blood sugar to 140 mg per 100 ml that means at that time your pancreas will begin to kick in and produce that insulin to take care of your blood sugar so you are essentially waking up your stomach your liver your pancreas and whole body so that's why if you do the math and then think of what actually happens then it makes sense to understand that even that tea or coffee with half a teaspoon of sugar or a little bit of cream is breaking your fast what about if it's just a black coffee session i just want to dig a little <laughs> deeper here let's say i let's just say i love co- i to be honest my morning coffee um i don't always have a double espresso sometimes i have a macchiato there's a little bit of oat milk or something in there so i understand that's probably going to throw you out of a fast but let's just say it's a double espresso um What do you think about that? Are we including that or are we taking that out? Yeah, I mean, as I say the thing is, you know, you are a very healthy uh, fit person and um a lot of us who are thinking about this black coffee thing, we are really healthy and fit. I'm talking about mm-hmm. people who really need the fasting and they just cannot live. They think there are a lot of people who think that hey, having tea with a if in the uk or in india and in many parts of the country, uh, world they will think that having a cup of tea with uh, with uh, biscuit is not breaking my fast in fact when we interview people when is your breakfast time people will say ah eat at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock in the morning and then if we ask well after you wake up what do you eat or drink then they will say that i have a cup of tea with milk mm-hmm. and with um, biscuit or something so we are talking about those people and they have to kind of understand what is breaking the breaking the fast mm-hmm. and for a lot of us having a having a double espresso is actually not kicking our uh, pancreas to high gear to produce insulin and that as i said uh, it, may not break our fast um we may continue our fast i want to come to 
um, blood glucose and and how time restricted eating um, can be affecting various aspects of our health, particularly if we have sort of um, metabolic dysfunction or poor metabolic health. But while while we're talking about healthy folks here, if someone is, let's say, lean um, from a, a physiological point of view, all of their kind of biomarkers or risk factors are under control, is there a benefit from eating within a, a shortened window um, would they be getting any benefit from time-restricted eating at all? Yeah, so there are a lot of people who complain about their sleep. So what we have, what you are seeing is um, both in animal studies and human studies, the people who do 8 to 10 hours time-restricted eating, uh, the first thing they mention is they sleep much better. Um, and we don't understand the mechanism, but we are seeing that the sleep improves. Another thing that we also see is a lot of people who believe they're healthy, they don't have any metabolic syndrome, they don't have any metabolic disease, they might have acid reflux, they might, might have bloating, they have, might have indigestion once in a while. And that reduces their productivity. And what we are also seeing is all of these uh, digestive issues become uh, much better. So for example, personally, I used to have acid reflux and, um, you know, many acid reflux medications should be by my bedside and I would lose sleep sometimes. And after I started time restricting 10, 12 years ago, I haven't gone to, uh, I haven't bought any new <laughs> acid reflux medic meds mm -hmm. uh, and I haven't used them. So this is one example where people actually will benefit. And second, and another thing is, you know, in long term, we all are healthy. We may be all healthy now. But if you think of what is what is our health goal, I used to say that if you can be healthy and without medication till your kids go to college or until you hit 50, that's actually a lofty goal. And you cannot do that unless you start planning very early. So time-restricted eating is almost like preparing for your retirement savings. It starts right. the day you start working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> From that day you start mm -hmm. saving. So similarly, to add those extra decade or decades of healthy life, um, people who are healthy, they should actually start doing this. Yeah, when, when you break it down that way, it makes my question look a little silly because it would be like saying, sh should we eat a healthy diet today if we're otherwise healthy? Or should we just wait <laughs> until we have have disease and then think about it? Um, so I think you answered that well. Thank you. Hey, friends. The scientific evidence on lifestyle habits that lead to longevity is clear. Now it's time to put this knowledge into action. I'm excited to announce the Living Proof Longevity Challenge, a 12-week program to build evidence-based lifestyle habits to optimize longevity. My team and I have transformed over hundreds of hours of conversations with experts on aging, nutrition, and exercise into a life-changing 12-week program that will challenge you to develop habits that lead to a longer, better life. This is a unique opportunity to gather health data about yourself that has the potential to change your life for the better. You'll start by testing 10 longevity biomarkers that tell the truth about where your longevity stands right now, today. Following that, you'll get a personalized longevity score to guide your 12 weeks of habit building that will boost your score and improve your biomarkers for the better. After the challenge, you'll retest your 10 biomarkers and see the proof of how powerful these science-backed habits really are. Head over to theproof.com forward slash living proof to download your zero cost copy of the Living Proof Longevity Challenge today. That's theproof.com forward slash living proof. Look forward to joining you on this journey. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit more about blood glucose because uh, you've mentioned that a few times and you know a, a staggeringly high number of people have type 2 diabetes. There are many people with pre-diabetes. Uh, I'm interested in how time-restricted eating can be utilized as a tool to help better blood glucose control. So what's the kind of relationship between um, the time of the day, our meal, and blood glucose control? And um, as an extension of that, 
perhaps you could speak to um, something that Emily and Courtney also spoke to, which is this idea of early time-restricted eating versus late time-restricted eating when it comes to to blood glucose control. And if someone has prediabetes or type 2 diabetes, what are some of the things that they um, should be thinking about here? Yeah, so that's a very loaded question. So <laughs> I will, <laughs> I'll break it down. So um, you know, when we think of circadian rhythm, we always think of connecting it to sleep. But actually, circadian rhythms are much more intimately re- uh, related to blood glucose, the regulation of blood glucose, cholesterol, and fat. And um, let's begin with uh, what happens, how all of these are connected. And this is very important because, as you mentioned, nearly half of the adults in Western countries, particularly in the US, UK, Australia, are either pre-diabetic or diabetic, uh, type 2 diabetic. And uh, this trend is also going up. So that means what we are doing um, as, a, as a society is something is very fundamentally wrong. And that may be this uh, eating randomly over a long period of time. Um, so as I said, in the morning, for example, when as soon as we wake up, if we eat, then at that time, our pancreas is not ready to assimilate food in a way um, that our blood glucose remains healthy. Uh, One thing we have to keep in mind that we always say um, some diet is rich in protein, diet is rich in fat, but the bottom line is almost all food that we eat has some carbohydrate, uh, unless you are just eating pure oil or pure uh, meat, Uh, but for most of us, it contains some carbohydrates. So that's why avoiding meal for at least an hour or two in the morning will help um, in preparing our body, particularly our pancreas, to respond to that carbohydrate uh, in a healthy way um, in the morning. And the second is circadian rhythm research is also showing that the pancreas is much better in responding to food and secreting good amount of insulin to control our blood glucose, uh, say two hours after waking up to for the next six to seven hours or eight hours. So that means eating a good big meal in the first half of the day Mm -hmm. is much better in controlling blood glucose because our digestive system and and pancreas are better in handling uh, big meal. I think that's a... a A really important point, sorry, Sachin, just to reiterate something there. Um, Given the number of people with poor blood glucose control that could benefit from this as a tool, um, I think this is worth kind of double-clicking on because if you think about, say, intermittent fasting or the standard sort of eight-hour protocol that became very popular, I know in speaking to a lot of people that that many people did a sort of midday to 8 p.m. style eating window, but from what you're saying – if you're wanting to get improvements in blood glucose control and if that's something that you're struggling with, it might be more beneficial to kickstart that eating window slightly earlier than that. Yeah, but not too early. That Right after you wake up, you should start eating. So have that two hours uh, wait time after waking up mm-hmm. and then try to eat um, around um, 9 or 10 in the morning mm-hmm. if you can or if you're waking up too early, maybe even mm-hmm. 8 o'clock. Is okay. Um, then there's another aspect that we often forget is, okay, so let's work on the end of the day. So what happens is for most of us, um, our body begins to prepare for sleep by producing melatonin two to three hours before our bedtime. So that means uh, if I'm going to bed around, say, habitually around eight, ten o'clock at night, then my body starts making melatonin uh, at eight in the mm-hmm. evening. So melatonin uh, for some for nearly half of half of the population, melatonin actually inhibits insulin release from pancreas. So that means if someone if I have my dinner at seven o'clock and my blood glucose is still high, my pancreas is kicking to produce enough insulin to bring that blood glucose low, then insulin eh, sorry melatonin comes in and inhibits that process so that um, my blood glucose can stay high for uh, 
several minutes or even an hour or two longer. So that's why having your last meal three hours before, at least three hours before bedtime is a pretty good idea so that you, uh, your body can um, kind of use that glucose without raising glucose, blood glucose too high. Would that mean, Sachin, um, sort of continuing that train of thought there, um, would, would that therefore mean if you're a shift worker and you are eating overnight, that it would be better through that shift to be around bright light so that you don't get that increase in, in melatonin as you're then eating those meals? Yeah, so if you're a shift worker and you want to, and your shift is ending, say, seven or eight in the morning and you're coming back home at nine, so then um, your, again, your last meal should be um, say around four to six o'clock in the morning so that you give yourself three to four hours, come back and have a nice dark room where you can sleep. And as you said, enough light so that melatonin remains low. Okay. And when we're thinking about um, the these sort of benefits with regards to blood glucose control or just big picture here, I think this idea of um, meal timing versus calorie restriction Inevitably, it comes up a lot, and I'm sure this is a conversation you've had many, many, many times. And I know that Courtney Peterson's work, and she explained on our episode, um, showed improvements in blood glucose control that were independent of um, of weight loss, which was really interesting. Yeah, which which sort of suggests that um, at least in that study, those subjects had improvements in blood glucose control um, independent of actually uh, losing weight. So this kind of I want to zoom in here a little bit on time restricted eating versus calorie restriction. And I think the the first question that I'd like to to kind of throw at you, which is often overlooked, is um, I, as I understand it, time restricted eating naturally leads to calorie restriction. and And if I'm right there, i'm I'm wondering, so in your studies when you or or in your colleague studies, when you get uh, humans to eat within a ten hour eating window, um, what happens to calorie intake? How much, if at all, does it kind of fall by on average? Yeah, so there are two parts. One is in the laboratory condition, when we do all the animal studies, we keep the calories constant. So the animals eat the same number of calories, whether they're eating randomly at random time or within time restricted eating. Uh, so that's why um, the term time restricted eating was coined because the calorie was not restricted, time was restricted. Right. When it comes to humans, um, since we all overeat, we are eating more calories than we need. Um, and mostly we eat more calories that we need by eating over a long period of time. It's not that we are squeezing all that calories into six hours and eating a 3,000 kilocal meal. Uh, we actually eat extra because we eat late into the night or we eat too early in the morning or both. Mm. So as a result, when we reduce our eating window, then there are a few things happen. One is people report that, particularly when you eat within eight to 10 hours, people actually feel less hungry. So they are not craving for that food. So as a result, they eat less and they can reduce their caloric intake. And um, most many studies where this time restricting is being tested, in those studies, people are overweight or obese. So that means for lifelong, they were eating more than what their body needs. And when you reduce that time window, then inadvertently they reduce their caloric intake by 10 to 20 percent in some studies 10 percent in some studies 20 percent and uh, on an average this is the group average 10 to 20 percent reduction and then at the same time you see all these improvement in glucose blood pressure and everything else so people always assume that uh, the the effect of time restriction is mostly through caloric restriction uh, but as Courtney pointed out, and in many studies, um, if we look at individuals, then we do see individuals who are not reducing their calories, but they still see benefits. Mm -hmm. 
Then there is another aspect of this that is not all diabetics are overweight or obese. Um, nearly one third of pre-diabetic and type 2 diabetics are actually within healthy weight range and they're still, uh, they cannot control their blood glucose level. And for them, the advice is not to reduce calories because they already have uh, normal weight and if they reduce too much, then they may become dangerously underweight. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, for normal weight, um, people with pre-diabetes or diabetes is intentional caloric restriction or time restriction. Which one is going to work? And no one has done that study. So that will be an important study mm -hmm. to do to see whether these effects are there. One thing that we are also forgetting that, you know, diabetes doesn't come alone. It has its sinister friends. And I can, kind of in the last book and circadian diabetes score, I described that. Um, many diabetic patients, patients with diabetes also have hypertension or high blood pressure. Uh, many of them also have high cholesterol. They may be taking statins to control their cholesterol. Uh, and we know that nearly ha um, a good proportion of people who take statins, they cannot tolerate it because uh, they have muscle pain. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, can time restriction help to... Uh, help for these people who are already uh, having telltale sign of pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes, have hypertension, um, or have high cholesterol, and they're on what we call polypharmacy. They're already taking more than two, two or more medications. And can time restricting help? Because these guys have already gone through trying to do caloric restriction because the first line of lifestyle intervention, any physician will say, is eat less and move more. And they failed that. Mm -hmm. And in our study, what we're finding is, yes, these people, a lot of them can actually adopt time restriction. And when they do that, then the blood pressure regulation is much better. They can, mm -hmm. whether they are on medication or not on medication, they always see improvement in both systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And then uh, within, yeah. But what you just said is really, really important and worth emphasizing that for some people, counting calories hasn't worked. And it's actually, I see it as uh, a, a nice, um, we're in a nice position to have multiple tools here. And I think I've heard you yeah. say before that um, people often have great difficulty counting calories but counting time is much easier, if I recall correctly. I think that's a quote I heard from you. Yeah. So, for example, between you and I, I cannot, I cannot count and tell you how many calories I have eaten today. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you exactly when I had my breakfast and even my lunch and snacks. Mm -hmm. So we are much better because we are designed to count time. So <laughs> we can count it. Um, yeah, so, uh, so these are some of the examples where it's not only controlling blood glucose, but with blood glucose misregulation, there are many other diseases that come with it, and time restriction can help manage those, um, those conditions. And also, um, I must say that counting calories is important, particularly when you know someone is uh, eating, say, 4,000 kilocal, and... <laughs> There are, there are a good chunk of population who actually overeat. They eat more than 2,500 kilocal, more than 25, 30% of what they need. And uh, sometimes those extra calories are actually consumed late into the night or at random times. So time restriction actually can be a way to manage or to improve calorie restriction. Right. Um, so that's a new approach that even the even card carrying researchers who do caloric restriction studies, they are coming to this understanding or coming to accept that time restriction can be in that toolbox to help people reduce calories. So tell me, with regards to kind of looking forward future research, I think it's you, you know you've you've made it clear here that time restricted eating can certainly help someone reduce calories and there will be some benefit through that, absolutely. And that that can be a great thing for someone who's struggled counting calories. I don't think anyone's debating that. 
um, you're also saying that your position is that there's some independent effects of uh, restricting your eating window, independent of weight loss. And my question that I kind of would throw to you here is, given that there is debate out there that I'm sure you're aware of, what kind of study would it take or is there a study that you're excited by that would would see time-restricted eating potentially end up, let's say, in, in dietary or in lifestyle guidelines? I think it's already in lifestyle guidelines. I mean, uh, the uh, American Heart Association put a position statement several years ago uh, saying periodic fasting, overnight fasting is good. Mm-hmm. And um, even the caloric restriction researchers would accept the idea that one should not wake up in the middle of the night to eat a small amount of calories. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that means they. Everybody accepts the fact that, yes, we should not eat for at least seven to eight hours when we're in bed. And nutrition scientists and gastroenterologists will also say that one should not eat one to two hours before going to bed because your core body temperature is high, you cannot sleep well, you cannot digest well food. So the bottom line is people accept the fact that one should fast or one should not eat for at least 10 to 12 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Then the other question is, okay, so um, is it, should people eat within 10 hours or should people just eat within that 12 to 13 hours and reduce calorie? And I think this is where um, the benefit is so little or the difference will be so little that you need to have a very large cohort, clinical trial, and also pick the right type of uh, target population who can uh, do this. The question is, is that worth it? Or should we do it in animal studies? Because in animals, we can control many of this. And in fact, one of the Mm -hmm. best animal studies addressing this was just published a few weeks ago, and I wrote an editorial in science, uh, sorry, a preview in science about it. And the experiment is very simple. People know for almost now 90 years that rodents, whether it's rats or mice, if you reduce their caloric intake by 10 to 20%, then mice live longer or rats live longer. And that's the foundation for proposing caloric restriction to increase lifespan. So now, a few years ago, almost... um, Six, seven years ago, um, scientists also figured out that the way the animal experiments are done, um, the caloric restriction studies are done, they were inadvertently doing time restriction because the control mice would be given, say, 10 grams of food or X number of food, amount of food. And that's they consume throughout day and night because food is in the food hopper. They have access to food all the time. And then the researchers would come back and calculate how much food the mouse ate and they would put 70% or 80% of that diet in one meal at one time in the late Mm -hmm. afternoon or evening. And then mice would eat that within two to four hours. And then for the rest 20 hours, they were fasting. Mm -hmm. So practically they were doing both caloric restriction and time restriction at the same time. So then the question was whether how much of that lifespan expect extension was due to calorie restriction and how much was due to time restriction. So that became very clear that this is an important question to ask. So the experiment was not very easy to do because you have to design a lot of engineering tools to feed mice tiny amount of food throughout day and night. So uh, these researchers, they brought mice and then divided them to many different groups. One group got to eat whenever they wanted and they figured out how much they lived. They reduced the calories and then fed them in, I think, nine or 10 equal meals throughout 24 hours. So they didn't have any time restriction, but they have calorie restriction. And by doing this, they found that these mice live 10% longer. So that's very clear that by calorie restriction, you can make mice live 10% longer. And there is no time restriction because in every three hours, 
these mice were eating something. Now they said, okay, so instead of feeding them in every three hours, if we feed them in every 80 minutes or 90 minutes and give them the same amount of food, either during the day, 12 hours, or the night, 12 hours, then what happens? Or if we do them, if we feed them in day, two hours, and night, two hours, then what happens? What they found was when the mice ate within 12 hours during the day, when they're even not supposed to eat, then they lived 20% longer. So that means time restriction alone, without aligning to the right time even, extended their lifespan another 10%. Mm -hmm. So now they ask, okay, so what happens if the mice are given the same amount of food, but at nighttime, because mice are nocturnal, they are, their circadian rhythm is designed so that they have to eat at night. And when they fed them at night time, they found that the mice lived 35% longer. So now imagine caloric restriction alone extends lifespan by 10%. Any kind of time restriction day or night can extend lifespan another 10%. And if you align the time restriction to the right time of the circadian cycle, then you can gain another 15% benefit. Right. That experiment, I think, uh, mm. nicely answered this question that in animals, at least, this kind of lifespan extension happens. Now, right. if you circle back and ask, what happens in human experiment and what did they find in mice? One interesting thing was they found all these mice that had caloric restriction, whether at daytime, nighttime, or throughout 24 hours, they had the same exact body weight. They all lost weight. They had the same exact muscle mass, the same exact fat mass, and this similar, very similar level of insulin. So that means your weight loss, your muscle mass, your fat loss, all of this that result from time restriction or caloric restriction is not going to predict what is going to happen to lifespan, what is going to protect you from disease. So that remained unanswered. So the question, the answer is yes, we cannot just look at weight loss as an outcome in human studies in caloric restriction or time restriction and say, hey, <laughs> there is no contribution of time restriction right. or so so fortunately the experiment is done in animals but we don't know what to measure in human to compare the benefit of time restriction plus calorie restriction versus calorie restriction alone mm, that was my question so short of kind of running a trial for for many many decades um what would be a biomarker or something that you could yeah measure to say, hey, look, TRE is affecting this marker, which we know is, is predictive of longevity, but calorie restriction is not. Um, and it gets me thinking, if we circle back, there was a word that we, we spoke about before, autophagy, and that often comes up in this conversation. And one of the questions that I was sent from people in the community was, you know, autophagy seems a little bit abstract. Is it actually um, something that you can, if you look, take a peek under the hood, can you objectively measure it? Yeah, it's really hard to say. And also, we should not think that autophagy is always good because, in fact, in cancer, we have to stop autophagy. We have to reduce autophagy because cancer cells do excessive autophagy to recycle and grow. So, mm -hmm. I think the point is we, sh we can just use common sense. If we take, you know, our, our body essentially is a function of 10 or 12 critical organs that function. Um, if we measure all these functions, bone mineral density, for example, for bones, muscle mass, muscle strength, then lung function, liver function, adrenal function, reproductive function, all of this, and then come up with a massive questionnaire and measurement tools. Then we can ask, okay, so th those are the health outcomes. Then the participant bottom. Whatever you do at the end of the day, if the participant has to work a lot to figure out what he or she has to do, then that particular lifestyle is not going to be scalable at a population health level. So that's the second aspect. 
And then the third aspect is the economy of scale. How much time and how much energy, how much resources are to be spent to make one person stick to that lifestyle? We know that, for example, diabetes prevention program, which emphasizes on reducing calories, eating better food, and doing more exercise, that has a price tag. And you know, depending on the technology, it, it has gone from four thousand dollars a year to fourteen hundred dollars a year. So similarly, we have to come up with a price tag. How much it takes to educate an average Joe? What is time restricting, and what is sensibly this person can do? So if we take health biomarkers or outcomes, then participant burden and the and then the financial cost to the society or to the person then we ask okay so what can we do to improve health whether caloric restriction alone time restriction alone or a combination of even three time restriction caloric restriction with better diet and i think that would be the answer optimum diet mm-hmm. um just enough calories within an optimum time window but i guess what will happen is some people can adopt one two or three and the 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 responsibility of scientists and clinicians is to give these options and make sure right. that these options each individual or the combination of two or three uh can benefit a person mm-hmm. yeah i think that's a really um interesting way of looking at this because it often feels like one threatens the other with regards to researchers working on different areas or just people in the public that are sort of passionate about one of these and I get it you know <laughs> there someone has a personal anecdote let's say for example they did a, a, a shortened window and they lost 50 pounds and then the next person counted their calories and lost 50 pounds and they're both equally as passionate about those being yeah. the kind of best tools um, but I think it's a really interesting proposition to think about I would hypothesize that if you could improve diet quality and get people eating over less hours that calories would be significantly um, lower per day on average um i want to come back to the protocol a little bit more because we spoke about that 10 hour window sort of 9 a.m to 7 p.m being something that that might be achievable for many people um Recently, I heard a colleague of yours, uh, I think you've published a few papers with him, Dr. Volta Longo, uh, express his kind of thoughts about fasting for more than 12 hours. And he, he didn't seem to be a, a big fan of that. And a 10-hour eating window, I guess, is a, is a 14-hour fast. And there are probably people listening here that have, that have heard um, Dr. Longo sort of express his opinion on that. And, and I wondered sort of where you land there. What is the what did he say? Well, I think he said that he 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 doesn't think for longevity it's optimal to be fasting for more than 12 hours a day. Is there any data? Not the question. Yeah, well, that wasn't that wasn't shared so I, I think that's a great yeah, question, so then, but uh, one has to be objective, you know. A lot of people have their opinion and uh, I cannot answer. I cannot address just somebody's opinion. Um because if there is scientific fact then I can go back and see whether the point is almost every animal studies that did caloric restriction even his own early caloric restriction studies they actually fed the animals for less than 6 hours and all of them lived longer than mice that ate healthy diet for longer than 12 hours okay so if if this thousands of calorie restriction studies it's not one or two it's literally thousands mm-hmm. because this has been going on for 90 years if they have shown again and again and again that feeding mice for less than 12 hours in multiple labs in male and female in multiple strains in mice in fly, mm-hmm. in uh, in rats and even in monkeys if they're not adversely affecting health, then there is no point to discuss this uh, based on one opinion. Okay. Yeah. So, so I guess I could rephrase that. You're in, <laughs> and, and, and you've, I mean, you've already made it clear, but what you're saying is you think a 10 hour, there's, there's no reason to think a 10 hour eating window is not safe would be an, uh, a better way for me to kind of position that. Um, 
And also another thing is we actually, there was a study done, Vince, there was a study done in Europe where they tried 12 hours time restricted eating and it did not improve any health indices for people who were unhealthy. So the experiment has already been done and it doesn't improve health. One question that comes up here a little bit is how much of this research has been done uh, on females and different different ages, different life stages. I know there's a, again, this is an opinion that I've seen out there and has been shared with me by a lot of people. So I'm not getting you to comment on um, the opinion so much, but more um, your sort of uh, feel for the evidence that, that exists out there and where you land. Um, but there is a doctor that has been um, sharing information online stating that there, the the TRE studies haven't really included many women sort of aged 40 and over, I believe, and that she doesn't believe that time-restricted eating is kind of healthy for um, women of that age. How do you how do you sort of feel about that? Again, that's an opinion. And, you know, it's good that we have to include more women in studies and we got to see whether they will benefit or not. Uh, but mm-hmm. the animal studies have again shown that uh, both young, middle-aged and also a little bit older female animals still benefit from time restricted eating. And in fact, for in animals, time restricted eating extended their reproductive lifespan. So that means these animals were still ovulating at the older age when the leaf fed mice have stopped ovulating. And then in our studies, what we have found is uh, female mice who were eating within nine hours, they were completely protected from endotoxin shocks, um, which is similar to bacterial infection. So in our study, what we found is male mice that were ad limitum fed, nearly half of them, more than half of them died when they're challenged with endotoxin shock. And nearly one third died when they did time ratio eating. The female mice, on the other hand, all 100% of them were completely protected. None of them died if they had done time ratio eating. So that's again another example. It means people always, you know, people are stuck with this idea, their personal opinion and <laughs> their conviction and the thing that, okay, Women cannot lose weight, older women, and it will not help. But the thing is, people have to be a little bit open-minded. And then, that, mm-hmm. I mean, it's a good question to ask that, yes, there should be more women in clinical trials. And in fact, there are many, in many of our studies also, we have included women, but the I must say that the number is not large enough to do statistical analysis mm-hmm. on individual gender and then uh, mm-hmm. figure out whether it's what we have seen is many women, they want to try all at the same time. And they also want to get most out of it. So then what they end up doing, they will try to do four to six hours of time restricted eating. So they are fasting for 20 to 18 hours. They want to reduce calories significantly. So the only thing they eat is salad and a few other nuts or something. At the same time, they want to run a marathon. And then what ends up happening is they are more likely to become amenorrheic and more likely to have low bone mineral density and brittle bones. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens. And it's actually, there is a syndrome called relative energy deficit in sports. And uh, REDS is more prevalent among women, but also there are many men uh, who succumb to REDS. So we have to keep that in mind that maybe some people took it to too extreme and they are the ones who might have suffered. And it's always those few other data that (laughs) complicate the field. You mentioned there uh, the the kind of uh, mice studies that have that have had uh, male and females. And and I think some people might be thinking about the kind of uh, reliability of translating findings in that research to human research. Um, and I know that you're a big proponent of of multiple lines of of evidence, but just with regards to circadian biology and thinking about hours, um, 
is the circadian clock in a in a in a mouse? Because I think we kind of glossed over this, but is it similar? Is it a twenty four hour clock, and and thus those eating windows in those experiments are quite easy to kind of translate to to human eating windows as well? Yeah, the clocks are very similar, and in fact, most of the clock genes and the mechanisms are identical or well conserved between mouse and humans. Uh, mm-hmm. Metabolism. We all know that there is um, some differences. So, for example, uh, 14 hours fasting in mice may be a little bit, should be equivalent to more longer fasting. If we just think about the, if you're thinking only about glycogen depletion or uh, fat oxidation, Um, but many circadian best parameters. So, for example, when I say um, gut repair, um, or there is a time window on which, within which the gut has to repair, or there is a time window in which the insulin-producing cells are more active. All of those mechanisms are very similar between human and mouse. So that's why we have to keep that in mind that, well, there are some aspects of metabolism, those are different, but when it comes to repair, rejuvenation, reset, these are very similar. I'll give you an example. How much do you think a mouse, little mouse that is 30 grams, that weighs 30 grams, runs every night? How many meters or kilometers you think? Oh, gosh. A little mouse. Uh, I'm going to say, I'm going I'm I'm to guess 1.5 kilometers. A mouse can run somewhere between 7 to 12 kilometers every night. Gosh. So that means <laughs> I should run between here and San Francisco every night. If I extrapolate that, but you know, that doesn't right. extrapolate that way linearly. Many things don't extrapolate linearly. So in that sense, yes, as the animals are smaller and smaller, they actually have a different metabolism. Just think of the hummingbird, how much it has to fly to get tiny nectar. So in that way, there are differences. Um, but when it comes to circadian rhythm or circadian related stuff, then there are similarities. In fact, a few years ago, we did a very simple experiment. We asked, does the benefit of time restricting depend on circadian clock, which is a very, you know, counterintuitive experiment to do from my lab because we always think of circadian rhythm. Um, But what we found is, yes, it does actually benefit even mice that don't have circadian clock because of genetic defect. And the reason is this, why we did this experiment. There are many genetic models of mice and laboratory animals that also succumb to similar metabolic disease as humans do. And as genetic testing is becoming more and more widespread, we always, we often blame it on our gene. We say, hey, I am diabetic because it runs in my family. I cannot help it. But actually the point is, if you have a faulty gene, then you can adopt good lifestyle to reduce the adverse effect of that faulty gene. And this is very important when it comes to a healthy lifestyle. The healthy lifestyles are actually something that we can do to address our faulty gene because we cannot change our genes, but we can change our lifestyle. And when we change our lifestyle, we can significantly reduce the risk for many diseases. So that's why we did the experiment. But the bottom line is yes, even time-restricted eating can override faulty genes that make mice obese, diabetic, or even have cardiovascular disease. Repair, rejuvenate, reset has come up a few times here. And uh, something that I think people might be thinking about is the longer that I'm fasting, do I get more compounding benefits with regards to repair, rejuvenation, rejuvenation and resetting the the system, so to speak. And you know, online you'll 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 see people um, posting about doing twenty four hour water fasts. You'll see people talking about three day water fasts. Uh, I'm interested in sort of hearing from you. Is is the longer the better, or? Is there a kind of sweet spot where you kind of maximize benefits and beyond that it could even be deleterious? I think I, this is where I want to bring dental care into picture. So, for example, if brushing your teeth once a day is like 12 hours time restricted eating, 
and brushing your teeth twice is like 10 hours time restricting and flossing and brushing is eight hours time restricting and then going to your dentist once in every six months is kind of doing water fasting once in a while. Mm -hmm. Are you going to go to your dentist every week? Mm -hmm. Will that improve your dental health to get your <laughs> teeth really scrubbed and drilled? No, I mean, this, this is exactly where we have to <laughs> do some common sense. The reason is, you know, this is where we can also go talk about reds because reds is actually an extreme form of being super conscious about your health where people mm -hmm. exercise more, eat less, and then they become, uh, they also develop many psychiatric and affective disorders and neuroendocrine disorders. So I guess anyone from 10 year old to 100 year old can eat within 12 hours. And a lot of us can try to eat within 10 hours so that at least for half of the days or five days in a week, we can eat within 10 hours, which is like brushing your teeth twice a day. And then if you want, maybe once in a while, it's a good idea to do even uh, like Walter Longo's fasting mimicking diet, four or five mm -hmm. days of very low calorie diet once in a while, or water fasting for 24 hours. So the idea is that is there are many different ways of fasting. One thing is we have to think about a lifestyle. Lifestyle is what, when, and how much we eat, sleep, and exercise every single day. And lifestyle is very different from intervention. Intervention is when you do something for a few days and then go back to your lifestyle. So that's why your lifestyle should be, say, 10 hours target. And once in a while, if you want to do some intervention to, for example, if you want to reduce your inflammation because your joints are swollen and you cannot uh, function well when you climb stairs, you have pain, then maybe... Pay attention to your sleep. Try to get eight to nine hours of sleep for a week. And on the same time, try some longer fast. And that may help. Let's start with this, this new randomized controlled trial of yours that was mm -hmm. published in JAMA. Tell us about the, the question or the questions that you were interested in exploring with this study and and then we can walk through the study design that you sort of use to answer these? Sure. So we were interested in the broader question, does time-restricted eating, which is a form of daily intermittent fasting where you effectively extend the fasting duration so you can... Um, you're fasting for a longer period each day, can, can that actually help people lose weight, right? So if you're an adult with obesity or you're overweight, can you use time-restricted eating to lose more weight? Um, or is it better to eat your meals kind of spaced throughout the day? So in our particular study, we were interested in testing something called early time-restricted eating. So these are approaches where you eat and say, um, you eat in the early part of the day, and you typically finish eating dinner in the mid-afternoon, and then you fast for the rest of the day. And in our particular study, we had participants eat over about an eight hour period early in the day and then they fasted for 16 hours a day. So for your listeners who are used to some of the terminology in the field, we, we might call this a 16-8 diet, 16 hours of fasting, eight hours of eating. And we were interested in whether this is a better approach for losing weight than what the standard um, person um, would do. So at least in the United States, if you look at data from NHANES, which is the largest nutritional uh, assessment, uh, that's looked at meal timing patterns. The median American eats over about a 12 hour period. Mm -hmm. And so has about 12 hours of fasting. So we were curious, you know, is it better to eat over an eight hour period early in the day? Or is it better to eat over a 12 hour period in the day? What's better for weight loss, for improving cardiometabolic health, for improving sleep, mm -hmm. and for improving mood? Mm -hmm. And this was kind of done in conjunction with what standard practice would be for weight loss. You sort of alluded to that, but maybe maybe walk right. through what that looks like. So if someone does go and, and see their physician and, and goes on a, a standard kind of energy restriction style diet, mm -hmm. um, what what does that look like? And, and, and in this study, what did that look like? Because yeah. um, that was a part of both groups. So maybe we kind of break that down a little bit. Sure. So we, in our study, participants enrolled in a weight loss program through our hospital. 
And what that consisted of was advice to cut calories by about 500 calories per day Mm -hmm. below their resting metabolic rate. Mm -hmm. In our study, we actually even measured their resting metabolic rate so we'd get that dietary prescription correct. And then they got counseling for how to do that. So they met with a registered dietitian about once a month, every month throughout the study. And then they were also counseled to increase their physical activity and to exercise, depending on whether they were sedentary or not. They received counseling to increase their exercise to at least 15 minutes a day if they did no exercise or at least 30 minutes a day if they did exercise. So, so counseling to, to help them reduce their caloric intake by about 500 calories a day. So for most subjects in this study, what did that look like? Were they, were they I'm just trying to think of a, a day in the life yes. of someone in this study, right? Yes. Were they actually, yeah. they had a certain um, calorie target that they were given from the dietitian, um, which was sort of 500 calories below what their body required for say maintenance, I assume. And then mm-hmm. they, were, they were reading labels and counting their calories throughout the day to try and hit that target. Correct, exactly. So this is a pretty standard weight loss mm-hmm. program. Right. And so this study is really interesting because that's what all participants were doing, but Correct. half of them did that across yeah. 12 or more hours a day. So not even thinking mm-hmm. about what hours am I doing this in, just wake up and count calories. And then the other half were also doing that, but they were mm-hmm. eating in this early time-restricted eating window. Is that right? That's correct. And those the participants who were in the early time-restricted eating um, part of the study, they had to eat their meals between 7 a.m. and 3 p.m., which is 1,500 hours. So we didn't give flexibility in this particular study. It was the same times for everyone, but we have other studies where we adjust that eating window relative mm-hmm. to when people wake up and go to sleep. Tell us what you found. What, yeah. were, the, what were the most, I guess, the, the, the most significant results that you found? Let's start there and then we can dive into some of the other things. Yeah, awesome. So we ended up finding that participants lost more weight when they did early time restricted eating. So they lost um, an extra 2.3 kilograms over the 14-week program. We did some very cool mathematical modeling to figure out what's the calorie equivalent, what sort of calorie deficit is that equivalent to, and we calculated, back calculated that that's equivalent to cutting your calories by an extra 214 calories per day. Mm -hmm. Um, so pretty decent effect, not massive. Um, but what I would consider a quite important effect for, for weight loss. And this is, I think, quite interesting because other studies have put that estimate at anywhere from 125 calories to 500 calories. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. the numbers are kind of all over the board and our data suggests it's about a 200 calorie a day, uh, uh, advantage that you get. Um, we also found greater fat loss with early time restricted eating. And we found early time restricted eating had no negative effects on muscle mass. And this was really important because the largest study previous or prior to ours found that time restricted eating when practiced by skipping breakfast actually negatively affects muscle mass. Uh, There was a slight, I don't know if you remember, there was another uh, article that came out in JAMA, JAMA Internal Medicine two years ago and they had participants skip breakfast and start eating around 12 p.m. Mm-hmm. And they found that uh, they lost, it was only a slight amount more muscle mass, but they lost uh, statistically significantly more uh, lean mass. Uh, and we found no evidence of that absolutely whatsoever. Mm-hmm. There wasn't even a hint of that. One of the things that was important about our studies is we counseled participants to eat the same food in both groups, right? And it's possible in the other study they didn't, you know, it's hard to know. They didn't, the other study didn't measure what participants ate. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a really important finding, greater weight loss with no negative effects on muscle mass. But we didn't find any evidence for selective fat loss or indicating that there was any sort of special effect that selectively pr- preserved muscle per se. And, you know, we didn't find at least evidence of any big effect for fat burning and preserving muscle. Um, there was small effects. Or, or said another way, the extra, when, whenever you lose weight, roughly on average, so say you lose a pound of weight, roughly about 75% of that's fat. And the other 25% is muscle. So we were trying to kind of boost that. Can we bring that 75% to 85%? And we found no evidence of that. It was the same proportion of total weight lost as that. 
I just want to clarify a few things um, and then let's continue on to some of the other things that you, you measured. Yes. Um, so you said the, the early time-restricted eating group on average lost 2.3 kilograms more body weight, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think from memory reading this, the, the paper, was it about six kilograms of, of total body weight lost in that time-restricted eating group and three point something or around four for the, the group that, that wasn't restricting their eating window? That's correct. Right. So this is over 14 weeks. So, that, so both groups lost quite a, a, a decent amount of weight, um, but there was that 2.3 kilogram, I guess, um, advantage to restricting the the eating window, which you said you sort of um, back calculated to be equivalent to consuming around 200, 214 or something calories less per day. Remind us why the early time restricted eating window was chosen as opposed to, you know, I think that a lot of people that are doing an eight hour window are doing uh, midday to 8 p.m., which I guess is considered yeah. late um, time-restricted eating. Maybe we, we should rebrand that to social time-restricted eating because it <laughs> allows you to yeah. still have dinner with your friends. Yes. Um, but why the choice of early time-restricted eating in this yeah. study? And do you think yeah. if someone's listening and thinking, okay, I could do the eight-hour thing, but I'd prefer to do it later in the day, uh, would there still be an advantage to doing that over just eating mm-hmm. over, say, 12-plus hours a day? Yeah, great question. The literature is so fascinating here. So dating back about 50 years ago, when they were first working out the properties of these blood sugar tests, they found that if they administered these blood sugar tests called oral glucose tolerance tests in the morning, people's blood sugar levels were much better controlled. Whereas if they gave the same tests in the evening, their blood sugar levels spiked significantly higher. And lots of groups around the world got the same results. So in most people, we know you have your best blood sugar control in the morning. And even as you get to the afternoon and definitely in the evening, your glycemic or blood sugar control is significantly worse. Um, This has been tested in a lot of different ways. Even if you take out cells of someone's fat tissue and you culture them in a Petri dish and you measure what time of day those cells are best able to metabolize glucose, you get a time about mid-morning around noontime. Regardless of the type of study, the type of approach, you can also infuse people, infuse glucose through an IV through people, and you'll come to the same conclusion. Now, there are, there are exceptions potentially for shift workers where this is not true, and for individuals, people with type 2 diabetes, and we, we can revisit those topics if those are interesting. But by and large, most people have their best blood sugar control early in the day. Mm. And so... Um, Studies have shown and give a lot of credit to Daniela Jakobowitz and Oren Freud in Israel. They did some really elegant studies in the last decade where they brought people in uh, to their clinic and they'd test what would happen if you ate a large breakfast, uh, medium sized lunch, and small dinner, or eat the same meals in the opposite order. And they found that if you front load calories early in the day, you actually reduce mean 24 hour blood sugar levels. You actually make blood sugar levels lower just by timing more of that caloric intake to the kind of sweet spot during the day when your blood sugar metabolism is at its highest. Do you, I just had a thought. Do you think that the timing of your meals, given what you're saying mm-hmm. now and, and how the body yes. can respond differently to similar food being eaten at different times over the day, I'm interested, we, we mentioned earlier visceral fat, and I think there's, you know, there's, from my read on the data, there's, there's a lot of reasons that could um, make someone more susceptible to storing visceral fat mm-hmm. and, you know, genetics plays a big part of that. And we see that with Asian populations, for example. Some people can store more subcutaneous fat, it seems. They have like a higher threshold before it spills over. Mm-hmm. I've seen various studies looking at like sleep deprivation. If you deprive Mm -hmm. someone of sleep, um, Mm -hmm. that might make them more susceptible to to increasing visceral Mm -hmm. fat. Do you think there, is it possible if you're eating sort of out of alignment with your circadian rhythms, that could change fat storage sort of mechanics and, and where we're actually laying down fat? Yeah, absolutely. Two really cool studies in the past year um, have tested exactly that question. They actually had people eaten either an eight-hour window or a 10-hour window, 
either early in the day or late in the day. And both of those two studies put people in what we call a metabolic or respiratory chamber where we measure how much fat that they burn throughout the day as well as, well as how many calories they burn. And both of those studies found that when people skipped breakfast and then ate within the same eating window or same length of the eating window later in the day, um, what we call fat oxidation or fat burning was impaired. So uh, their body did not burn as much fat. So there's a lot of things that kind of line up suggesting our metabolism is, metabolism is fine-tuned uh, to be most active in the morning. And I'll give you one more example. There's something called the thermic effect of food, which is how many calories you burn in digesting and metabolizing your food, and that's actually a little bit higher in the morning than in the afternoon. So you burn slightly more calories when you eat early in the day. It's not a huge effect. So um, we think most of the benefit from eating early in the day actually um, is due to not burning more calories, but actually due to the fact that it suppresses your appetite. I can talk a little bit about the data there because it's it's quite cool. Yeah, let's 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 go into that. I do have one question first. You you started the eating window at seven a.m. Mm-hmm. Um, is was there a kind of rationale for seven a.m.? Was that based on when the average person was was waking up? And if if someone's listening and yeah. thinking, um, you know, maybe they don't wake up that early. Maybe they wake up a bit later. What's the key thing here? Is it is it starting your eating window say after an hour of waking up or after two hours or eating yeah. straight away? Do we have any mm-hmm. sort of idea as to what would be optimal there from a, a blood glucose control point of view? Yeah, we don't have a super clear picture. There's some hints, but um, studies where they infuse glucose or blood or sugar into someone's bloodstream indicate any time between like six and ten is fine for starting okay. breakfast. You'll hear a lot of other researchers talk about the fact that cortisol is elevated in the morning, which is absolutely true, and we know cortisol acutely worsens your blood sugar control. But there are other things at that time of day that are already maximally activated. For instance, your pancreas is primed to produce insulin at that time of day. So that kind of outweighs the, fact, the negative effects from cortisol being higher that time of day. Okay. So it's not going to be damaging if you're racing off in the morning and, and have to slam, slam down a breakfast within an hour of waking up. That's right. Now, there may be some subtleties there because some people have a a genetic variant of one of the melatonin receptors, which means their melatonin levels stay elevated for longer. And we know melatonin also acutely raises your blood sugar levels. So there, in some people, it may be better to wait a couple hours a little later until those melatonin levels fall more precipitously. How would someone know that? Would it, would it just be sort of understanding if you feel drowsy? It's probably not the, <laughs> yeah. the best time to be having breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Aside from getting genetic testing, probably if you're, if you're drowsy or if you just notice like a a rapid blood sugar, you know, increase, you know, wait, wait a couple hours. The other thing you can do is try to get some bright light exposure first thing in the Mm -hmm. morning, because that'll drop your cortisol levels as well as your melatonin levels. That's a great tip. You were talking about appetite and I sort of derailed the conversation there. So let's come back to that. Awesome. So there are a number of studies that show if you eat more of your calories earlier in the day, it lowers your appetite. So one of the studies had people eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and dinner like a pauper. And they found throughout the waking day, most of the waking day, appetite levels were lower, despite the fact that participants were eating the same total number of calories. Um, In one of my clinical trials, we... um, We also measured appetite hormones. We measured ghrelin, which is an acute hunger hormone. So this is a a hormone that makes you just like hungry in the moment. Um, And we found ghrelin levels were lower at the end of the fast, which was kind of the opposite of what we were expecting. We thought at the end of an 18-hour fast, people would be quite hungry. Mm. But we found just favorable improvements in a bunch of appetite hormones, also including PYY, which is a satiety hormone. We found that was better activated in the evening. Yeah, that's that's very interesting because I guess from a from an evolutionary perspective, um, yeah. I, I would have thought consuming less calories and restricting your eating window would increase the the hormones that would stimulate appetite to get you out looking for calories. Right. Um, right. Interesting. Let's come back to the study. So uh, you mentioned there 
there was greater weight loss of that 2.3 mm-hmm. kilograms in the early time restricted eating group. Now, I'm not sure if this was um, misreported or if this was actually one of the findings in the study, um, but am I right that at least in the 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 main group of subjects, there wasn't a significant difference in fat loss. And if 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 that's right, what what explains the significant difference in weight loss but not fat loss? Yeah, it was mostly fat loss. It was mostly fat mass. So it was the same proportion of weight of fat loss and muscle loss as in the control group. It was just a greater total amount. And the cardiometabolic um, outcomes. So I think one that one that sort of stuck out to me was blood pressure. So you saw That's some correct. some quite interesting findings there. Correct. So we found that early time restricted eating was more effective for lowering diastolic blood pressure. Our results for systolic blood pressure were the same in magnitude. They just didn't quite reach statistical significance because there was more variability in that endpoint. Um, in this particular study, we found no improvements in fasting glucose or fasting mm-hmm. insulin. Um, hard to know exactly why that is. We have followed that up with what's called a per protocol analysis. These are analyses where you look at just the participants who actually stick with the program. And in that per protocol analysis, we do find that early time restricted eating improves glucose levels and insulin resistance. Uh, okay. We just didn't find that in the, ma- the main study. And then we wow. found no effects on lipids, which are which is consistent with all the other studies that, well, all the studies that we've done in our lab, as well as most other studies out there. We don't think there are any profound effects on, on cholesterol or triglycerides unless people are losing weight um, per se. Okay, that blood pressure one is is quite interesting. I'm sure there are people listening who who have elevated uh, blood pressure and have been told to to kind of change their their lifestyle. So that's that's an interesting finding and and perhaps something for for such people to to explore. Um, and I was I was interested in your dis- in the discussion you mentioned, or maybe it was in the results that the mm-hmm. magnitude, so the 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 reduction in blood pressure was similar to what you would see if someone adopted a dash diet or was doing endurance exercise. That's correct. So we saw a four point drop in diastolic blood pressure, which may not sound large, but for context, these were not individuals who had most of our patients didn't have hypertension, right? Mm-hmm. So they already had blood pressures around one, I think it was 124 <laughs> at baseline. I can't remember exactly off my top of my head, but given that their blood pressure was already, you know, decent and not super high, this is actually quite a decent change. And it's similar to what we've observed for the DASH diet, which is the leading diet that's currently recommended for treating hypertension and um, high blood pressure. What would it take, do you think, or is it already in the sort of hypertension cardiovascular guidelines? Do you think there's there's mm-hmm. more research required for this to be added sort of alongside DASH as, a, as another potential tool? Yeah, yeah I, I think more research is needed. We did another study where we also where we found a 10-point drop in blood pressure, but it was a better controlled study. And there have been about, I would say, about three other studies that have found improvements in blood pressure. Improvements in blood pressure are fascinating because we don't yet know whether they're due to the time of day people are eating, you know, early versus late in the day, or whether it's due to the extra fasting duration. And what's quite interesting is there's a bunch of research in the 1970s that showed if people fast for two to three days, there's a particular mechanism called fasting naturesis, which basically means like fasting induced um, extra excretion of sodium from the body, which in turn lowers blood pressure. But no one knows, do you get that same benefit from shorter duration fasts? So Mm -hmm. one theory is we might have seen these benefits just solely due to the longer fasting duration. But there's other data suggesting that if you eat earlier in the day, regardless of your fasting duration, your body can also just get rid of excess sodium, that there are also Mm -hmm. changes in sympathetic tone, which may effectively relax your blood vessels and also reduce blood pressure. So we have no idea what the mechanisms are or what's driving this, but there's some really cool data out there suggesting that all of this makes sense, um, that you would get a benefit from the early time restricted eating. Is it is it possible that some of that that blood pressure improvement is driven by the the difference in in body weight change? Or did your analysis okay. su- suggest that it's the magnitude of of reduction there is such that it can't 
be purely driven by weight loss? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. I don't remember if this made it into the final manuscript, but we did do some statistical analyses to adjust for weight loss to basically ask the question, were these, was this extra benefit in diastolic blood pressure due to weight loss? And the answer was most of it was not due to the extra weight loss. Okay. Interesting. Any, any adverse effects? You know, some, sometimes the a common question I get uh, yeah. from folks is, you know, is, is time-restricted eating or, or is in- intermittent fasting, is it, face, is it safe? Are there any kind of downsides? We didn't see any major side effects in this study other than what participants called, um, you know, like hunger um, or malaise. But we've done other studies where some participants have reported they were more thirsty which also mm-hmm. makes sense in the context of that fasting naturesis because if you're excreting ester sodium from the body, you're also excreting extra water. And this is mm-hmm. similar to what happens also on a ketogenic diet. There's also a little bit of ketogenic diet-induced naturesis or excretion of sodium. And so I know people on those diets often have to consume more sodium and more water. So we think there's a mm-hmm. little bit but a smaller type effect with intermittent mm-hmm. fasting. Okay. So perhaps if, if someone's doing this, be conscious of your hydration. Correct. Um, So how would you summarize this? Everything we've spoken about, someone sits down with you and says, just give me one or two lines. What are the biggest takeaways from this that you want people to walk away with? Yeah. So I would say we found pretty clear data that the time of day and the fasting duration, one of these two or both of these two affects your body weight or affects how much weight you can lose. And that basically if you do intermittent fasting, um, by eating early in the day, it'll help you lose more weight and I'll lower your blood pressure. The other thing we haven't quite covered yet is also the effects on mood. We also looked at mood in this study and we asked people about their energy levels, feelings of depression and dejection. Um, we also asked them about anxiety, anger, tension, etc. And we found, um, that people reported greater improvements in mood with the early time restricted eating. So they reported greater energy levels, fewer feelings of depression and dejection, um, less fatigue and inertia, and uh, just a better overall mood. So that was pretty exciting to us because it was, to my knowledge, that's the first study on intermittent fasting, to first randomized controlled trial of intermittent fasting to report improvements in mood. Okay, amazing. It's really interesting. If if someone's uh, listening to this and thinking, very cool study, um, early time restricted eating, um, right. sounds like something that I might try, but they heard us speak about the study design and they, they, mm-hmm. they're not so keen on counting calories. And, <laughs> yes. uh, you know, I think there's many people out there that have tried it. They think it's, it's mundane. Um, it, it perhaps, uh, is putting too much focus on food all day. It's a lot to mm-hmm. think about, um, especially right. if you're a busy person yes. with kids and yes. a job, um, it's, a, it's just an extra task and, and we only have so much bandwidth. So um, I guess that person might be considering, well, is there any benefit to me doing the early time-restricted eating if I'm also not counting calories? Will, will there still be an advantage for me in terms of um, my body weight and my metabolic health? Yeah, absolutely. The vast so we're up to over just over 50 clinical trials on time restricted eating in humans. And if you look at what are called meta analyses, so these are um, sort of where you lump together the results from all the studies and you see is there weight loss benefit. Almost all these studies have participants not count calories. And if you look at the net effect across all studies, there is a benefit for weight loss. Um, and just for context, about half of st- clinical trials on time-restricted eating report a weight loss benefit. The other half don't. But when you pull all the results together, there is a net benefit for weight loss. And most of these studies um, don't have participants count calories. So yes, absolutely. In fact, we think one of the big advantages of time-restricted eating is you don't have to count calories. You just count time on the clock. Okay. Way easier rule for most people, right? So for our studies, when I talk to other scientists, they're kind of blown away by how little instruction we have to give people, right? Like if you came in and tried to get someone to eat a healthy diet, like a Mediterranean diet, low-carb diet, you know, you name it. 
there's a lot of food education that goes into that, right? And there can be financial barriers to people mm. and logistical barriers. Like I got to come home from work and cook a, you cook a meal and then you may have to make trade-offs. Like, am I spending time with my family or, or am I not? But with time-restricted eating and most forms of intermittent fasting, it's a timing rule. So then it just becomes for, I think, your listeners, do I want to try this or do I not? I think a lot mm. of that is, one, I'd say there are lots of meal timing approaches out there. But second, a lot of the figuring out whether you can do it is just your schedule. I want to learn uh, a little bit about your your work and look into night shift workers. Uh, I get yeah. a, a lot of folks messaging me who uh, work overnight. Perhaps they are yes. nurses. I, I understand that was one of the populations that right. you looked at. Um, interested in okay, I'm I'm actually awake overnight, so not a typical day for a human. How how should I be setting up my meal timing? Is it am I eating? overnight during that shift? Am I eating sort of earlier in the day? Do I eat right before right. I go to bed? Um, and I know that you were recently involved in this study. I believe it was cross-sectional. I'll let you kind of explain mm-hmm. what it was. Um, but yeah, t- t- tell us about the rationale for that study with nurses and, and what you found. Sure. So we did a cross-sectional study looking at nurses and nurses who work the night shift versus nurses who work the day shift. And quite strikingly, we found that nurses who work the night shift have about, at least in our study, they had twofold higher insulin levels, as well as way higher leptin levels. That indicates they're having problems with um, blood sugar metabolism, and also their appetite is sort of out of whack, so to speak. Um, In this particular study, we didn't test time-restricted eating. However, one of my good friends and colleagues, Frank Shear at Harvard, just came out with a phenomenal study this year looking into exactly this question. Because the big question for people who work the night shift is we know their circadian rhythms are different. Often their circadian rhythms are weaker, and they're also effectively in the wrong time zone, right? Because they're kind of used to being, you know, making uh, people alert at night. And so the big question is, do you eat on your night shift when it's dark outside, or is it better to eat during the daytime? So they did a study where they took people who who didn't normally work the the night shift, but they put them on a night shift, and then they had them. It was what we call a crossover study, so meaning they tried both eating during the night shift as well as eating um, during the daytime, and their blood sugar control was actually better when they ate during the daytime. So probably it's better for night shift workers to eat during the daytime when the sun is out. But we don't know for certain yet because that particular study didn't use people who habitually mm-hmm. work the night shift, if that makes sense. Um, so, But it's, it's, it suggests that it may be better for them to eat during the daytime. So until there's, there's kind of more research there, if we think about how someone may structure their sleep that's working night shift, and let's say that they're working at, mm-hmm. I don't know, 10 p.m., to 6 a.m. Mm-hmm. type shift, something like that. Right. And so they, they finish work at 6 a.m., they get home, sort of 7, 8 a.m., they're at home. It's now daylight, but they, they're going to actually go to bed soon. So mm-hmm. right. are they, would it be, would that be the optimal time to get a lot of calories in um, right before they're about to go to sleep? Or would they, would it be better to sort of shift that back, go to sleep? perhaps with less calories or um, certain types of nutrients, perhaps the, perhaps there's a certain mm-hmm. type of meal makeup that might be best then. Um, and I'm just throwing ideas out there. And then eating more of their calories when they wake up at 3 p.m. or whatever it is between that that period where it's still light outside before they go back to work. Yeah. So the the data from Frank Shear's group suggests that they should eat right before they go to sleep. So say they come off their night shift at around 7 a.m. in the morning, they should eat right then, go to sleep, and then eat again when they wake up. Mm -hmm. You mentioned in email to me that you were also interested in time-restricted eating and cancer. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm curious. Is this something that you're when the, in the field is looking at in terms of cancer prevention, or is it a sort of adjunct or, or alternative therapy for people with certain types of cancer? Correct. We're looking at it as an adjunct. So, meaning, if you take people who have cancer, can we imp- improve their abilities? Uh, to basically beat the cancer and or reduce the side effects of chemotherapy and radiation. Okay. And 
what evidence do we have around time restricted eating or like shortening windows? And Mm -hmm. uh, like, is there any observational evidence, for example, that people who eat over a shortened period of the day have lower risk of getting a cancer or lower risk of recurrence of a of a cancer? Is there any data there? Yeah. So there's some data. So there's some cross sectional data and some data from randomized clinical trials. So there's some cross sectional data suggesting that those who eat over an, I think it's 11 hour or shorter time window have, I think it was a 36% reduced risk of breast cancer recurrence. Um, so there was some data suggesting effects on preventing cancer. And uh, recently, there have been, there have been a couple of clinical trials in this area too. And I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of backstory because it's super fascinating and it doesn't often come up when you hear about intermittent fasting. So Walter Longo, I have to give him a huge shout out. He's done a lot of really important work in this area, but he's really pioneered something called the differential stress sensitization theory. And it's this basic concept that if you fast cells, healthy cells, prior to chemotherapy and radiation, so before chemotherapy and radiation starts, it causes the healthy cells to go in this self-protective mode where they upregulate their antioxidant defenses and so forth because they're, they're kind of like, oh, no, there are not a lot of nutrients or growth factors around. Let me kind of go into this self-preservation mode. So then when chemotherapy and radiation come along, those cells are bef- better with, able to withstand the negative effects of chemotherapy and radiation. And so they actually die at a lower rate. Conversely, um, tumor cells, because they have what are called oncogenic mutations, so they have these alterations in their DNA, they have, they're like rapidly growing and dividing, right? That's what cancer does. And as a result of these mutations, they actually can't activate these same self-protective pathways. And as a result, when they are fasted, they actually have to rely on different um, fuel to fuel their rapid growth. And so the fuel that they rely on actually produces more molecular damage, more free radicals. So they actually end up dying at a higher rate. And so what's super cool in these animal studies is if you fast animals prior to chemotherapy and radiation, you boost the effectiveness of chemotherapy and radiation dramatically. But if you fast them after they start chemotherapy and radiation or after they're done with chemotherapy and radiation, you don't get the same benefit. So you can actually enhance the effectiveness of chemotherapy and radiation while reducing side effects. So we actually have a clinical trial right now in patients with rectal cancer where we're trying to test this differential stress sensitization theory in humans. And what we're hypothesizing we'll see is if you, um, is with the time, we're again t- testing early time restricted eating with more, more leniency than in our other studies, but still an eight hour window. But if you test early time restricted eating, we're testing whether it can reduce the negative side effects in chemother- of chemotherapy and radiation, right? There's a lot of nausea, vomiting, headache, dizziness, hair loss. Can we reduce some of those nasty side effects, but also boost someone's chances of actually beating the cancer? So in other words, can we shrink the tumor? Right. And so is that that's a, a, a randomized controlled trial or what's the study design there? That's correct. Randomized controlled trial in 300 patients. It's a two-site clinical trial. One site is here at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, where I work, and the other is at Cedars-Sinai Medical Center, which is the largest hospital in the Los Angeles area. So everyone is going through sort of standard cancer treatment, pharmacotherapy, and then correct. some of these participants are given a restricted um, eating mm-hmm. window intervention correct. on top of that. And so the, the idea with the adverse effects is, does that go back to what you said earlier around it's possible that this fasting sort of builds resilience in healthy cells? Correct. Exactly. That is exactly the concept. And some people will even call this hormesis. If you've heard the, the term before, this idea that a little bit of injury kind of um, increases your body's ability to be resilient or more resilient in the long term. Mm. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. Is it is it possible that say the protocol for uh, a, an eating window for someone with cancer and preventing cancer recurrence mm-hmm. is different to everything we've been talking about with regards to mm-hmm. average person wanting to maybe shed a few kilograms and improve their metabolic health? Absolutely. In fact, there was one study suggesting that certain forms of intermittent fasting may be worse for cancer. So there was a cool study done in animals where they, um, they had the animals either cut their calories every day 
or they cut their calories by a more dramatic amount on some days and by a less dramatic amount on other days. So it just, you know, is um, kind of an inner, what we call intermittent energy restriction. So they didn't restrict their calories every day. And in that case, um, daily cutting of calories was better for slowing the growth of tumors. So timing may matter in different ways for different conditions, which makes this super interesting. And I, I, there's also a unique challenge with cancer patients, right? A lot of them have trouble eating because of all the side effects, right? So we may find that it's intermittent fasting may not be very doable. Um, Walter Longo, when he developed his fasting mimicking diet, he was finding that only about a quarter of patients were willing to fast for 48 hours uh, prior to chemotherapy and radiation. So that's how we got motivated to look at other intermittent fasting approaches rather than just looking at fasting, water-only fasting per se. So where's the, the field, I guess, at oncology in terms of applying this knowledge? Is, is right now, is it yeah. a, a sort of more of a level of uh, early excitement and, and hope and there's not really any specific protocols that you could give a, a patient? That's correct. We don't have protocols yet. So we've had, in the last two years, we've had explosion of interest in this area. And in fact, the National Institutes of Health in the U.S. actually put out a call for proposals to study intermittent fasting in cancer patients. And our, ours was one of the ones that got funded. Um, so we don't have the data yet, but the trials are starting to come out. But I can say there are two trials that I know of that are starting to find some suggestive benefits um, of intermittent fasting on cancer. Neither of them tested time-restricted eating. They tested other forms of intermittent fasting, but one of them tested what's called the fasting-mimicking diet, where you eat a very low-calorie diet, so typically about 800 calories for three to five days in advance of every chemotherapy infusion. And they found, um, when they looked at the cells from the tumor, they found evidence that it was less um, progressed, so to speak. So... Um, and they found um, some evidence of more uh, remission, cancer remission. It wasn't a slam dunk in the study. Mm -hmm. uh, they just didn't have the sample size for that. But there was some evidence that, they, that this differential stress sensitization theory would, might be true. Super interesting. I want to talk a little bit about your research looking at fasting and cancer as a sort of adjunct therapy to immunotherapy. Um, before we slide into that, you've mentioned longevity diet a few times. I think people will be well aware. Um, you're, you're quite well known for the fasting mimicking diet. Just at a, a kind of high level framework for for the average person out there, how how does this look? Is this the longevity style diet you're eating um, on a daily basis? And for the for the many reasons that we've already discussed, um, along with resistance training and, and um, a lifestyle that helps you reduce frailty. You're doing that daily and then some periodically you're doing a fasting mimicking diet depending on where your health is at. Yes. So, um, so for, for 30 years now, since my days with Walford, um, I've been looking for the, the substitution for the calorie restriction, which I mentioned earlier, right? So, and then I think it took me 20 years. And then about 10 years ago, or maybe a little bit earlier, looking at cancer patients, but also in general, um, I, we started uh, asking the question, what if you just, instead of being restricted all the time and being miserable all the time, what if you just most of the times eat normally, whatever you can do, whether it's a longevity diet or whatever, you know, not, not so good diet you may do, and then you just intervene for, let's say, four or five days um, you know, it could be once uh, every six months or so all the way to once a month, right, for five days. And uh, so now, you know, going forward 10, 15 years, uh, um, it seems to be working very well. So that, uh, um, that you know, if, for example, uh, if you think about, I'll just give an example in mice. We took mice and we did a, a, a sort of a little bit of a crazy experiment. So what if you just give them high calorie, high fat, and, you know, just the worst diet that you can think of. And then uh, once a month, you give them five days of the FMD. And then you give them, put them back in this terrible diet. It's just remarkable. The, if just five days a month of the fasting mimicking diet is able to reverse all the problematic effects of, uh, of this high-fat, high-calorie diet. So the cardiovascular disease uh, or conditions, the, um, the, the weight 
the um, uh, lifespan, right? So people on a west, uh, mice on a western diet live a lot shorter and very sick, cholesterol super high, and you know they they, they look very much like the the human uh, reflected very much their human profile, and they just a five days a month completely reverse it. Uh, now this is not to say you know keep a bad diet and then do five days a month, but um, that's how powerful that those five days can be. And now it gets tricky, right? Because then some people say, well, if five days is so powerful, well, why don't I do 30 days, right? Why don't I keep going? Well, the body has a way to then eventually switch you to what's called a thrifty mode, right? So it, it, so you just got to get it right. Uh, and, and in that study, we've shown that the mice, and as we've seen for the people in the clinical trial, they seem to, if anything, accelerate or continue fat catabolism. So they keep breaking fat even after you ter- return them to the bad diet, right? And, um, but we, what you don't want is the opposite. Eventually, the body enters in this uh, saving mode because it detects a very rough environment. And so then it goes into hypometabolic mode. And this is actually an old New England Journal of Medicine paper. If you push enough, the too much calorie restriction, the body goes into a saving mode. And now you're burning less fat and less energy. So your energy expenditure is reduced. Now you got a problem because now the body, you're gonna, you, you, the system is going to want to regain the weight and maybe even overshoot the regain of the weight and gain more weight than you had originally, right? So this is why we, we tell people, be careful because uh, it, the, there is a lot of mechanisms and um, and you need to understand them uh, very well, otherwise you're going to have a problem. Mm-hmm. So what exactly is the, the fasting mimicking diet? It's five days of less calories, specific foods. What, what does it look like? Well, the, the fasting mimicking diet um, is actually uh, looking at um, which ingredient, as I mentioned earlier, affects IGF-1, which ingredients affects glucose level, insulin levels. And uh, which ingredient makes the, the person um, happier and, and uh, so society uh, is, uh, um, is high and, and the hormones that they control the leptin, ghrelin, et cetera, are in the right place. So, so it's a, essentially it's a high plant-based fats, um, low protein, very low protein, very low sugar, um, low calorie diet is, uh, and, and we have all kinds, right? For cancer patients, it's about 600 calories a day. For, not, for normal people, it's about 1,100 calories a day, uh, day one, and then goes down to 800 calories on day two, three, four, five. And the idea is to, if you measure IGF-1, IGF-BP-1, glucose, ketone bodies, they should be very similar to those that you will obtain if you were just doing water-only fasting. Usually, from lots of work in mice and, and humans, it's about one. So four, uh, five days of the FMD are equivalent to uh, maybe four days of a water-only fast. But, you know, the water-only fast, uh, obviously, it's, uh, it's extremely difficult to do, but it's also fairly dangerous, you know, and, uh, um, you know, because of hypotension, hypoglycemia, and lots of other problems. So people could do it, but I would not do it outside of a specialized clinic in. If someone's wanting to do FMD, where's the best place for them to go to to learn more about that? I cannot say it because uh, I'm the founder of, of a company that, this, that this does that and um, I could donate everything to charity or to research. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I think that uh, unfortunately I cannot talk about, I cannot talk about companies. Uh, yeah. Right. Um, but you can you can get a copy of your book and you can Google it and and probably find it pretty easy. Um, in terms of of like how often someone would do uh, FMD, I've heard you speak before. Is that going to depend on where someone's health is at? Say, for example, someone who has really good metabolic health, is healthy body weight, very active, versus someone who has type 2 diabetes, uncontrolled blood glucose, for example. Yes. So now we're very happy that we, 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 in in the sense that our collaborators, let's say, have done lots of studies now on diabetes, prediabetes, and 
Um, and so uh, it works very well for prediabetes and diabetes. And now a new study came out of the University of Heidelberg where they did uh, once a month, both the University of Heidelberg and University of Leiden uh, in Germany and Holland did the studies on, on diabetic, uh, diabetic patients, both worked extremely well. And these were monthly cycles of the FMD, right? So um, monthly cycle of the FMD, but at the end, even in the 12 month long study, um, not most people uh, or a lot of people uh, did not do it every month, so they skipped some cycles, but it still was very effective. Let's say if they, if they did it between six and 12 times on year one. So, yeah, so if you're a diabetic, probably starting once every month to once every two months is going to be the way to go with the hope that. Um, uh, so, for example, we just at the clinic in Milan, we treated a doctor and he had diabetes. And, um, and so on year one, I mean, we did a combination of the longevity diet and the fasting making diet. He did it maybe five times in the first year and a half. And then, you know, two years later, he was diabetes free, right? So now he maybe does a couple of times a year once he's um, back in the normal state. So, yeah, so then I think that's, uh, that's how you want to think of it. You do it when you need to do it. A diabetic person, maybe once every month, every two months. Somebody who's mm-hmm. pre-diabetic, maybe every three months. Um, and, uh, and then somebody who's an athlete and extremely healthy and very insulin sensitive, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, maybe, you know, a couple of times a year. Now, keep in mind that um, we, um, in mice, we clearly shown this regenerative stem cell based regenerative uh, power of the fasting making diet. What does it mean that, you know, whether it was the pancreas, the gut, the, the, the nervous system, uh, you know, lots of different systems, we, the, the blood system, the hematopoietic stem cells, the fasting making diet caused the turning on of, of uh, uh, stem cells. And then during the refeeding period, these stem cells went to work and contributed to, it, to the regeneration of various systems. Now, in people, it's harder to prove it. So we're starting to, to, to have evidence for that, but, uh, but it's going to take a while. So, yeah, so then I'm just trying to go away from the diabetes in, into you know, mm-hmm. processes that everybody will want. Um, yeah, if this is also true in people now, uh, this fasting making diet refeeding cycles can gen- can introduce a multi system regenerative uh, uh, effects that um, that could uh, could make a big difference in in lots of organs. How much do you uh, feel, or do you have a sense of of how much of this kind of re- regener- regeneration and improvement in certain metabolic um, or biomarkers of metabolic health when doing FMD are driven by calorie restriction and weight loss versus the kind of specific foods and nutrients that um, are within that diet? Um, I mean, obviously, you can get lots of the effects of, um, of uh, the FMD with water-only fasting, um, we do have papers where we show that, for example, the prebiotic content of the fasting making diet uh, was very important in the, in the effects in the uh, inflammatory bowel disease in the mouse model. So, so I think it's, it's both, but um, the, um, the weight loss uh, in our latest human uh, paper uh, we're actually showing um, no correlation with the weight loss, um, meaning the weight loss happens. It's probably beneficial, but it wasn't that people that lost most weight were benefiting the more uh, on, on lots of markers and, um, or, and risk factors. So, yeah, so the, there was no correlation with the weight loss, uh, um, suggesting that that's not, the weight loss is not key in this, but it's more, the um, pushing the system um, to a state, a, a metabolic switch, right? So if you just think about diabetes, right, and, and, and the origin. So we, we look at diabetes as a, as a disease, and, and then you give people lots of drugs. And, um, but uh, if you think about 10,000 years ago, um, people in the summer had to become probably overweight or obese, and I always talk about the emperor penguin, right? The emperor penguin, um, they become fat, 
um, because they're going to go about two to three months with no food at all, right? So every year they become fat and they become insulin resistant. Um, and so they can put away the fat that mm-hmm. allows them to survive for those two or three months where they have no food at all. And so uh, this is clearly our history too, right? So we used to have moments of lots of fruits and lots of nuts and lots of honey. Um, so yeah, you had to become fat during the, the period. And then what unlocked that state was probably fasting, the first five days of fasting. Now, probably, if, as I was saying earlier, if you continue, now you go from a fat accumulating mode to a energy expand, low energy expenditure mode, right? So, yeah, so then that's why the fasting mimicking diet and not the water-only fasting. You want to switch person to the insulin-sensitive mode, but not to the low-energy expenditure mode, right? The, the, the true starvation response. And that's tricky, and this is what we specialize in. And, uh, yeah, so, so I know people like to improvise, and like to, but, uh, you know, usually when you do that, you get hurt. And in the long run, you might not understand it and see it. Uh, in the long run, you're going to get hurt. And I mean, um, we, we work very hard to make sure that uh, we try to get it all in the right place. And, uh, you know, we're slowly getting there. Mm. Yeah, you see all sorts of, you know, um, very long-term, 30-day, 40-day water fasts, people doing them on online. So um, something to, to kind of think about there. But th- that that... That last point that you made, um, so a protective, so insulin resistance can be protective um, in an environment where there is a shortage of calories and you're coming into a famine and then you're going to need to draw down on some of that fat. Um, But then, as you say, if you're in a really big calorie deficit, if I'm hearing you correctly, your body then goes, well, hang on, there's low food availability where... Um, we're not getting a, many calories in here and storage is running out. Let's, let's reduce the amount of energy that we're, we're burning or utilizing as an organism to, to kind of help preserve some of this energy as a survival kind of tactic. Is that right? Yeah. And this is you know, shown by the New England Journal of Medicine, right? So uh, people forget these papers. Like that. I don't, I'm not, it's entertaining. Like somebody was saying every 30 or 40 years, people like to repeat the same science but uh, yeah these papers are out there and um, and uh, it's very clear that um, that's a mistake right to 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 not do it it's a mistake as 99 percent people don't do it so everybody in the world should do at least one or two cycles a year just to unlock that insulin resistant state of the fasting making diet and of course you don't want to do water only fasting because you know most doctors will say, and most experts will say this is not something that people should do at home, stop eating. Uh, and also because of what I was just saying, the water-only fasting may dr- uh, drive you into the, because it's not clinically tested, and uh, it may drive you into this thrifty mode, uh, even you know, in, in, in a few days, uh, not clear, but um, uh, some of these studies are not allowed anymore, right? So uh, Enzo Keys back in the 50s and 60s had done these semi-starvation studies in humans, and that was probably the last time in hi- human history those would be allowed. Um, but this, if you read them, they're just remarkable, remarkable uh, studies of, of human volunteers that you know undergo this four weeks uh, or more of, of starvation time. But the, the, the biology and the physiology out of that is, is just incredible. Yeah, I'm not sure that'll get ethics approval. I'm not sure there would be no, so. people putting their hand up to do that. You'd have to pay them a lot of money. You'd be surprised, you know, you'd be surprised. If it was like a study done by a university, there'd be some uh, some volunteers for anything. But yeah, I don't think it'll get a ethical approval. I want to finish here on uh, FMD as a potential um, adjunct therapy for someone who has cancer. And I know that you, you had a, a study that um, you shared with me looking at mice with with breast cancer, um, where you investigated the effects of of FMD. So talk talk to me, I guess, firstly about the the interest in in FMD and cancer in the first place, and what your hypothesis was or is. 
Yes, um, my point uh, um, is that we have the nobody that, that we've ignored in the oncology field is differential property of normal and cancer cells. So I always talk about the analogy of the desert. You take a, a billion people, um, you put them in the desert, you give them um, no water, no shade, and you make them run. And you come back after two weeks and 100% of them will be dead. And um, if you put them in the same desert and you uh, give them water, you give them shade and they can let them sit, I would say after a couple of weeks, they're all alive, right? So, so yeah, a billion people, is it possible that you could change such a few things and a billion people will be either all alive or all dead? Yeah. So the same is true for, for cancer or the, let's say this, this uh, principle can be applied to cancer. Why? Because the cancer cells cannot stop running. And so, um, and so if you take away the food, um, they, uh, they're in trouble because they, now they have less food, but they're running. Uh, but this is why now the combination with standard of care comes in, right? And that's, uh, and that's why we always say, you know, you have, you have this camp of the alternative people and the, the, the ones that are obeying some of the FDA and the medical uh, rules and the ones that refuse them, Right. But in fact, it's a combination of both that seems to be very effective. Why? Because now if you are um, a cancer cell and you're just giving fasting or fasting-making diet, you can still manage because you steal from, from the system, right? You steal from other cells. So you can get the amino acids, you get the sugar, you just uh, deprive the other cells from it. Uh, this is why the, the chemotherapy, the immunotherapy, kinase inhibitors, hormone therapy, et cetera, et cetera, they're so effective together with the fasting making diet. So you generate a differential uh, environment, right? So uh, the normal cells, they know exactly what to do. They've been starving for billions of years if you start from the bacterial ancestors. So they know exactly what to do. The, um, the cancer cells, just they do all the wrong moves, right? They keep on going and now they can still keep on going as long as the immunotherapy or the chemotherapy or the radiation comes around. And then, and then it's clear that this is why in mouse model we see, you know, cancer-free survival over and over and over. Um, if you combine the, the fasting making diet with the, the whatever most effective cancer treatment you have for that cancer. Uh, now in people, well, uh, the f now there's lots of studies uh, for the fasting making diet in, in, in clinical trials, and they look very, very good. So. For example, the 125 patient randomized trial uh, breast cancer done in University of Leiden, published a couple of years ago, showed a, um, a uh, both clinical and pathological effect. So the patients that did the fasting making diet together with chemotherapy responded much better. And I think there was a five-fold reduction from 27% to 5% of the non-responders. So the patient, the portion of patients that did not respond to the chemo. And another fantastic thing about the trial is that those respond. If you look at pathology, so the, the, the surgeon takes the cancer from the breast and then it looks at how many cancer cells are active uh, in that cancer. And then they, they, they score it. And it's called Miller pain scoring. And, um, and there's a dose response. The patient that did the, all the cycles of chemo with the fasting making diet were the one that by far had the the lowest um, um, you know, score, meaning that they had the least can active cancer cells within the, uh, the, the tumor mass, right? So it's very nice when you see that, um, that you know, dose response. Um, yeah, then another uh, study by Claudio Vernieri at uh, the Italian uh, Cancer Institute, uh, National Cancer Institute, Actually, they did two papers, one on 100 patients and one on five patients. But I, I really like the one on five patients because it showed, I think in the title, it had extraordinary survival or extraordinary effects of standard of care together with the fasting making diet in five patients. One had pancreatic cancer. So I really like that because uh, I like the, the sort of hope factor in, in saying, hey, you know, maybe um, if you run out of options, uh, you know, the FMD in this case could make a difference. It may not. We don't know yet, but, but, but it could, right? So, so talk to your oncologist and, and, um, and ask him or her to uh, consider the, the fasting mimicking diet together with the standard of care. Because in some cases, in many cases, of course, we follow thousands of patients, but 
I, I don't like to talk about that because people then say, oh, yeah, he's talking about a case. He's trying to make a clinical trial out of a case. But we've seen it with many patients. But uh, the clinical trials are now are starting to, uh, to show the, the, the effects that we've seen with, with lots of stories. And, um, and lots of hospitals are now starting to do it. And I've heard from U.S. hospitals. Now they're saying now we do it with every patient. We give them the fasting making diet. So, so yeah, so we'll see, but it uh, looks very promising. And, and also very inexpensive, right? You know, people can, uh, even somebody who's poor um, and, and can only afford to get ke- the old chemotherapy, um, that certainly a water-only fasting, if that's all they got, um, is something that uh, could make a big difference in their treatment. In these studies where they're using it alongside traditional um, treatment for whatever cancers, the, the subjects have in the study, is it being done uh, in the same manner as, say, for example, what you've used in studies for people with type 2 diabetes? Is it still a five-day thing or are they doing it every day throughout their treatment or 10 days? I'm, I'm presuming it's not every day because the, the, they'd be in too much of a calorie deficit. What's the, the protocol look like? No, 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 it's not every day. It's actually shorter. It's four days. It's about 600 calories for four days. Uh, the normal people is five days higher calorie. This is four days lower calorie. And um, yeah, so this was, now it's been 15 years of, of arguing with oncologists and, and physicians and, and trying to come up with something that we're all happy with. And I think, you know, we're close to that there, meaning that as I mentioned earlier, we don't see loss of lean body mass uh, if it's done correctly. There is a exclusion criteria for, you know, somebody comes in with too much uh, uh, frailty or cachexia or um, other, um, or, you know, muscle type uh, degeneration. Um, yeah, so then some, some people are excluded, um, but uh, I'll say that the majority or maybe the great majority can be included or can be brought to a, a level where they can be included, maybe with some muscle training, et cetera, and, um, or improve nutrition, and, and then they start the fasting mini diet. So, yeah, so then, yeah, four days um, combined time with now with the immunotherapy, with the chemotherapy, with the radiation uh, so in every case, uh, there is a different design um, in the clinical trials. We spend some time with the oncologist uh, uh, to, to make sure we time everything correctly so that, um, you know, for example, in the case of immunotherapy, we want to um, make sure that we don't interfere with the efficacy of the immunotherapy, um, but at the same time, uh, uh, get the maximum effects. Here. What's it going to take to, to kind of... Um, build on your confidence as to how effective FMD is um, during cancer treatment and potentially to be, say, included in cancer guidelines and to have more oncologists. I know you mentioned that there are plenty that are using it, but to, to kind of get the word out there to, to more and more oncologists, you know, what, what further research is, is required? Yeah, first of all, I think the patient is number one, meaning that the patient should, if the oncologist say not, the treatment is not working, I don't see it, you know, I don't see, I don't have much uh, hope. I think it's good to go to oncologist and say, well, can, we, can we try the fasting making diet together with whatever it is that, uh, that you recommend? And then, of course, uh, like for everything, you know, uh, it takes a long time. And I'm for, that's unfortunate because... Uh, um, I think I always say the science goes very fast and the FDA goes very slow. And there are good reasons for the FDA to go very slow because, you know, they have to make sure they filter out uh, a lot of ideas that uh, are not uh, uh, true, right? So, you know, with COVID, we heard lots of stories, right, at the beginning of what was making patients uh, healthier. And then mo- the great majority of it was not true, right? So, yeah, so then the oncologists know this and, and they basically say most of the stories we heard were just stories and eventually did not make the cancer patient live longer. Um, so, yeah, so I think that, you know, the, it's going to take a long time. And, um, but, you know, there's a lot of trials and, um, and I think that as the success stories uh, uh, like the one I just mentioned come out and the papers in animals 
increase, um, then I think uh, uh, there's going to be many, many hundreds. Like, I, I don't know if this is going to have the potential of immunotherapy. But let's say that it did, um, then, um, you know, eventually there's going to be hundreds of hospitals that are going to start doing clinical trials on immunotherapy. And this is what happened. So immunotherapy was first discovered in the mid-90s, right? It took a long time uh, for that, for the explosion, probably around 10 years ago, you started seeing the explosion on the clinical trials on immunotherapy and then the success stories um, in various cancers, right? So... So then from the 95 discovery of immunotherapy to the now, it's what, uh, 27 years. Uh, so 27 years to get to uh, where immunotherapy is a central part of, of cancer treatment. And that's, uh, that's the way it is. And, uh, you know, and, and, and part of it is because you have so many cancers and so many therapies. Right? You, you have to eventually check everything with everything, right? So immunotherapy in, in together with some other drug for the treatment of this stage of this cancer, right? So there are really, really hundreds of combinations and, and that's why you need hundreds, and, or if not thousands of studies. There you have it, friends. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did and want to stay up to date with future episodes, be sure to hit that subscribe button on YouTube and follow on Apple or Spotify. Finally, thank you for showing up and the effort that you're making to take control of your health. I look forward to hanging out with you again in the next episode.